Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Medical Board of California's quarterly board meeting. Pursuant to the provisions of Governor Gavin Newsom's Executive Order N-29-20, dated March 17, 2020, this meeting is being conducted via WebEx. Public comments will be heard for each agenda item for individuals wishing to do so. In order to be ready for public comment, we ask that you please ensure that your comments can be heard clearly by connecting to the audio of this meeting through the proper method. If you are having difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting, it could be because the device you are connecting with has bandwidth limitations. If you do have difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting using your device as audio, please click the ellipsis button at the bottom of the WebEx application or the communicate menu at the top of the WebEx application and then select audio connection. You will see an option to call in and will be provided with a telephone number, access code, and attendee ID that you can use to connect to the meeting audio via phone. Using the information provided, it will automatically disconnect your device's audio and connect your phone to the name you join the meeting with. By using this method, if you are having audio problems with your device's audio, this will allow you to still participate and hear the audio of the board meeting. Please see the instructions on how to connect link on the last page of the meeting agenda for step-by-step -step WebEx instructions, including screenshots. Thank you, President Pines. You may now start the meeting. Thank you. We're calling the meeting to order. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to ask all of us to please turn our cell phones to silent. Since this meeting is being conducted via WebEx, I will ask all board members and speakers to announce themselves by name before speaking for clarity of the official record. All board members are able to unmute themselves to speak during the meeting. Please place yourself back on mute when not speaking to reduce background noise for all participants. Following such online meeting etiquette will ensure the best quality for everyone. During each, oh, where am I? During, during each call for comments from board members and speakers, we will ensure that all comments that can be accommodated are heard before proceeding with the agenda. Government code section 11126.5 allows a board to remove people who are willfully who willfully interrupt a meeting and to clear the room or the virtual space if order cannot be restored by removing or muting the disruptive people. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and we'll ask for public comment on each agenda item. This is an official meeting of the Board of Cal Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. The board welcomes public comments on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. During each agenda item, the host moderating this WebEx will activate the Q&A feature of WebEx and will ask anyone wishing to make a public comment to indicate so by replying yes. The host will then call on individuals who indicate they wish to make public comments by name. When called upon, the host will unmute the microphone of the individual and they will have three minutes to make their public comment. The host will audibly announce when 15 seconds remain to conclude the public comment. After the three minutes have lap lapsed, the individual will be placed back on mute. Only one public comment per agenda item is allowed per attendee. Please see page four of the agenda for WebEx instructions on how to connect from the link on the agenda and additional instructions. During agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the total public comment period for individuals to 40 minutes. Therefore, after 40 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 20 minutes will be allowed for the comment period. After 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. The board's IT staff will assist me in receiving the public comments via WebEx during this meeting. I wanna remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to the allotted time or less. Today's meeting will run according to the Open Meeting Act as required by law, and we plan to end around 5.30 p.m. today. I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that board members unmute their computers. Ms. Codwell, please call the roll. Ms. Campo Verde. Present. Dr. Nadez. Here. 
Dr. Hawkins. Here. Dr. Krause. Present. Ms. Lawson. Here. Ms. Lubiano. Ms. Lubiano. Here. Dr. Lewis. Present. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Dr. Thorpe. Here. Dr. Torado. Here. Mr. Watkins. Present. Dr. Yip. Present. Ms. Pines. Here. Thank you. A quorum is present. Board members, please mute your computers. I would like to remind the members again that we will be taking a roll call vote on all action items. Moving to agenda item two, public comment on items not on the agenda. Before I ask for public comments, I would ask individuals making comments to not discuss pending complaints, pending licensing applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to the members that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussions should, should Therefore, such discussions could create a conflict and lead to a board decision being challenged in the Superior Court. The board can receive comments regarding the board's processes in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. In addition, the board would like the public to address the board as a whole and not individual members. Please be aware that public comment during this agenda item should provide information to the board members it is not a discussion between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take is to listen to the comments and decide whether or not a future agenda item is on the topic. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. Though this may seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's mission. If you want to comment on an agenda item, please wait until we get to that item. Comments at this time are only for items not on the agenda. Please limit your comments again to three minutes. I will now ask the host for public comments. Thank you, Ms. Bynes. I've uh, gone ahead and activated the Q&A window. If anyone would like to make a public comment, uh, please indicate so in the Q&A window. Uh, you don't need to type out your entire question because I'll go ahead and call on you and allow you to ask it yourself. Um, first up, I have Colin Ross. Colin, let me open your line. Colin, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Please go ahead with your public comment. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to, I was reading on the website that a pilot program was started regarding uh, transitioning Mexican physicians uh, into primary care in the state of California. In the uh, and and I you know didn't know about this program and wanted to uh, present some concerns from other individuals, not just in California, but also around the country, who think that we are better qualified. Uh, had to go alternative routes to become experts in primary care through either research, teaching, or what have you, and just did not understand why this program selected just, uh, you know, phys physicians from Mexico who apparently are bilingual uh, and, and had to go through some sort of training process as part of their requirements to speak English uh, and also take care of Spanish patients, where you have other individuals from Spanish-speaking countries who've grown up in this country who, through a combination of training and education and research and publishing and a very stellar track record could fill the same role. Uh, so I just want to know when the board would be meeting again to discuss this program in depth and also so that I could invite more individuals who meet those qualifications and could fill the roles of primary care clinicians who are already here in the United States who may not have gotten the residency slots that they were seeking or were shut out of certain residency slots, but found alternative ways to practice medicine at the primary care level within the United States. 
and speak other languages too. That's basically my question and comment. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Beth Darnell. Uh, give me a moment to open your line. Beth, are you there? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, please go ahead with your public comment. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name is Beth Darnell. I'm an associate professor at Stanford University in the Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative, and Pain Medicine. Um, I'm an NIH and PCORI funded researcher who studies best practices in prescription opioid tapering, and I'm a member of the CDC Opioid Work Group. I've spoken to multiple medical boards of several states on the topic of proposed opioid prescribing policies, and I just wanted to offer a brief comment um, for the California Medical Board. The 2019 uh, Health and Human Services Opioid Tapering Guidance strongly discourages forced opioid tapering. Um, this HHS tapering guidance also advises against blanket opioid dose limits for prescribing and also for deprescribing, so really discouraging policies based on dose. Um, the tapering guidance also encourages patient-centered pain care and patient-centered opioid prescribing that is based on physician autonomy and takes into account individual considerations of the patient, their individual circumstances, and medical comorbidities. The American Medical Association has strongly supported these recommendations and actually extended them much further. Multiple studies have documented patient harms that are caused by forced prescription opioid tapering, and um, my comment is that we bear an ethical and professional responsibility to ensure patient safety in prescribing and deprescribing. Science has suggested that dose changes in either direction confer risk and must be appreciated. So there's risks as doses are escalated and also risks that are um, incurred during opioid deprescribing or what we call tapering. As a Stanford professor and researcher, I conduct patient-centered research on best practices for opioid deprescribing with a very keen eye towards patient protections. And as the board goes forward in considering how to best protect the patients of California who are living with chronic pain and maybe taking opioids, um, I am advocating for a very strong eye to patient protections in this regard and would just like to make myself available at any point in time for consultation or advisement on this particular issue as we have protocols and best practices um, in place. And with that, I just thank you for your time. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Danush Pagorji. Let me unmute your microphone just a sec. And Danush, are you there? Yes, hello. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm just a third year medical student listening in on the California board. So just want to say hi and thanks for having me. That's it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, next up, we have Faith Gibson. Give me a moment to open your line. Faith, are you there? I'm here. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm a, uh, a California licensed midwife and also the executive director of the California College of Midwives. And our members have brought to my attention that the medical board is employing obstetricians to review quality of care complaints against licensed midwives and using expert reviews by obstetricians as a basis for disciplinary charges against licensed midwives. Section 18 of the BMP code um, 222.0. Point oh eight requires professional parity between the expert reviewer and the licentiate being reviewed. It says complaints shall be reviewed by one or more medical experts with a pertinent education, training, and expertise to evaluate the specific standard of care issue raised by the complaint to determine if further field investigation is required. As we know, obstetricians are not trained in midwifery and do not practice midwifery. Such inexperience means they are not qualified to evaluate, quote unquote, the specific standard of care raised by the complaint. Employing non-midwives to review midwifery complaints violates this section of code. One thing we know for sure, the medical board never sends quality of care complaints against obstetricians to be reviewed by licensed midwives. 
I've attended quarterly meetings for the last 25 years and been present for several discussions by board members, agency staff, CMA, ACOG, and malpractice carriers about due process as applied to expert reviewers. Several presentations included, um, this included several presentations by administrative law judges who explained the legal requirements and how they were to be applied. One of those was Judge Roman and the other was Judge Liu. Each explained that a license to practice a profession in California is legally equivalent to ownership of private property, such as a title to real estate or stocks. Efforts to revoke or diminish the rights conferred by such a license must be consistent with due process. As applied to licentiates practicing under the medical board's jurisdiction, expert reviewers are required to have the same type of license as the licentiate being reviewed. That is, only an MD can review complaints against an MD. Only a board licensed acupuncturist can review a case involving another board licensed acupuncturist. While this doesn't prevent MDs or medical specialists from testifying at an administrative hearing, that is separate from expert reviewer status during the investigatory process. However, the medical board is still paying hospital obstetricians to determine if licensed midwives who practice in out-of-hospital settings have departed from the community-based midwifery standard of care. This should have never happened and should be stopped immediately. Um, 15 seconds remain. Okay. Uh, I did send a letter about this issue in early August to the board and ask for it to be uh, forwarded to uh, Board President Denise Pines. I don't know if she got it, but no one from the board has contacted me in reply. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Eric Andrews. Eric, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, this is Eric Andrews from the Patient Safety League. First, I'd like to offer an encouraging welcome to the new board member, Alejandra Campoverdi. Hopefully, she'll be a, the second member of the board who actually takes patient safety seriously and won't feel pressured by the doctors on the board and the untoward influence of the Cal Medical Association, whose sole purpose is to protect doctors, not patients, even though only one third of the state's doctors choose to be a member of that organization. Secondly, I'd like to dedicate our presence here today to our fellow patient safety comrade and the president of our board, Edward Hollingsworth, who passed away on October the 2nd. You all may know him as Marion Hollingsworth's husband. Normally, if I were here at the meeting, I'd hold up a photo of Ed, but as is usual with the medical board staff, they are preventing me from being able to use visuals for my presentations. I sent several emails asking for the ability to show visuals and no one replied. Clearly an effort to keep me from having visual evidence of this board's wrongdoings. One day, COVID will be gone and you won't be able to stifle the evidence I bring to the meetings once again. In that same vein, I want to catch Ms. Campoverdi up on a few things. I wanted to let her know that the DCA quickly subpoenaed all my Facebook records, including private conversations with harmed patients about their cases with doctors. This is likely due to Kimberly Kirkmeyer's ongoing paranoia, the same paranoia that sent her barnstorming into employees' offices demanding to see if they had been corresponding with me. And yes, Ms. Campoverdi, this may seem unbelievable, but it's documentable. You're now participating on a board that violates patient safety's advocacy rights. Question for you all to ponder to yourselves. How many of you followed up with anything I said at the last meeting? Anyone? Because I see no topics on the agenda that relate to anything I had to offer you. So when you say you hear us, we see little evidence of that. I'd like to call into question the three board members that are still serving while the legislature has not confirmed them, Dev Ghanadev, Richard Thorpe, and Asif Mahmood. All three were appointed to prior to July 2019. Due in part to COVID, but also due to complaints written to the legislature regarding their appointments, their confirmation hearing was postponed. It's never been taken back up, and I recently confirmed that with the Senate Rules Committee. By law, the Senate only has 365 days to confirm their appointments, and that date has now passed. The committee said that the governor extended some of the deadlines in a recent COVID executive order. However, I looked up the executive order and the only date he extended was his own deadline to actually nominate people to serve under government code section 774B. There's no mention of 1774C, which states that if the Senate refuses to confirm, the person may continue to serve in the office until 60 days have elapsed since the refusal to confirm or until 365 days have elapsed since the person first began performing the duties of the office. 
By my calculations, those dates have all passed and these three gentlemen are no longer qualified to be serving on the board. I would like for another board member to call a point of order to deal with this before the meeting proceeds as you now have people serving on violation of the law. And again, this was concerned by the Senate Rules Committee. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Rosie Author's daughter. Let me open your line. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to make a public comment. And I would like to thank the previous commenters, uh, many of which have uh, things similar to what I have to say. I'd like to thank Dr. Darnell for her comments on the appropriate treatment of chronic and or intractable pain patients who do not have substance abuse disorders, but are treated as if they do in violation of state law and standard of care set by this board. There's also an extremely pervasive communication problem within this board. In the last five years, almost six years, I've been communicating with the board regarding something that should have just been housekeeping items. And the rights of patients are overlooked. The problem is pushed down the road. We get promises, nothing happens. There's no reply to written communications. The item that I asked to have put on the agenda for this meeting and two of the board members asked for it as well was not put on that agenda. When I contacted the person responsible for the agenda, his response, of, uh, his response to me was that I was asking for a different question and I needed to start all over. Six years later, uh, January 2015 is when I first started this process. The patients are your stakeholders. They're care providers. Their healthcare providers. These are your consumers, not competing stakeholders. And I made a list of things I said in another letter today. It's not a complete list, but the first item there is there needs to be genuine communication between the board and the stakeholders. And that's just not happening. And that's dangerous because what's happening is by default, patients are being misdiagnosed, mistreated, and abused. And patients who have intractable pain and may require as a part of their treatment, access to ongoing long-term uh, medications, including opioids or other controlled substances, are being told that they are substance abusers, drug seekers, and being told that they are being forced to taper they are going to be terminated if they complain. And in fact, if you do make a complaint. 15 seconds away. If you do make a complaint, you're not going to get any care and you're going to die as a result. This is not the same thing as somebody who's not following the doctor's orders. And this is a protected class. So this needs to be looked into seriously and not just ignored over and Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Susan Lauren. Give me a moment to open your line. Susan, are you there? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, nine years ago this week, Dr. Saul R. Berger committed a disabling surgical assault on me. During what I expected to be a conservative, medically indicated breast reduction, he removed my gluteus and other needed deep myofascial tissue over 60% of my body. After the vile, unwanted battery, he slandered me, said I had factitious disorder. Well, it's well known that perpetrators and their enablers falsely blame victims to protect themselves. They use DARVO, deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. They make the perpetrators out to be the ones picked on and harassed. Negligent and abusive doctors lie, hire IMEs and lawyers to lie for them, and their boards lie willingly. Berger's notes are fabricated, his photos are misleading. He caused permanent, severe bodily damage to me, but the medical board did nothing to stop him. 
Berger's defense hired Dr. Terry Dubrow, who the medical board hires as a surgical expert, as the IME in my case against Berger. Dubrow used his medical board credentials to sway my jury with lies, leaving me without restitution and leaving future patients unprotected. I know multiple women who claim bodily harm by Berger and Dubrow. Dubrow, who the medical board empowers, is being sued again. Take some time to read his reviews. I filed a complaint on him, but of course your board denied it. Rachel Den Hollander, a Dr. Larry Nasser abuse victim wrote, as survivors will tell you, saying something is one thing, being heard and believed is another. It's a common assumption that you, if you are abused, it's because you did something wrong. When abusers feel protected and empowered, they tend to escalate their visibility, like those TV shows, and abuse. The medical board did nothing to help me or others, so I'll focus on the real heroes, the women who con consistently speak up to your board, and I wrote a poem for them. Here's to the heroes. Here's to the heroes who speak through their pain. They witness for others with no personal gain. A few speak in harmony, some zigzag, others plain. They are in it to the end, on the increase, not the wane. Here's to the heroes, reluctant as they are. They travel by plane, talk by phone, arrive tired by car. Some reside close while others live far. All challenge the virtues of the California medical czar. The opponent is delusional about the dismal statistics they boast without a thought to the fact that complaints unfiled rank most. So many deaths on their hands, meetings are packed tight with ghosts. Our heroes make sure to end the board's self-congratulatory toast. Here's to the heroes, to the tenacious, the few, I'll finish, the patient, the pain, they know exactly what to do. They research, their research educates those who have not a clue. Here's to the heroes, and by them, I mean you. That's to the women. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I don't see any other requests in queue, Ms. Pine, so you can proceed. Okay, great, thank you. Moving to agenda item three, approval of meeting minutes from the August 13, 14, 2020 quarterly board meeting. Members, please unmute your computers. Are there any additions or corrections to the board meeting? Minutes. Okay. Move to accept minutes. to accept. Oh, I'll I, have, I have a correction. Okay. My correction is on page 46, item 25. And in that, I want to add that, let me just get the actual wording right. I'm clarifying a statement I made on the, in the board meeting. Mr. Watkins would like to build on the sexual misconduct by having a presentation on sexual boundary violations and from an addiction specialist in the area of substance use disorders. Okay, that correction is noted. And I want to just convey my condolences to Ms. Hollingwood. Hollingswood. Thank you. Are there any other additional changes or comments? Okay, we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, I will now ask the host for public comments. Okay, we've reopened the Q&A box. Anyone like to make a public comment on agenda item three? Please indicate. You get a few more seconds. I'm not saying anything yet, but <clears throat> okay, Ms. Pines, I don't see anything at this time. Okay. Uh, All right, great. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cobble, please perform the roll call vote. Ms. Campo Verde. Abstain. Dr. Gonadev? Yes. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson?
Yes. Ms. Luciano? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Mahmoud? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. Dr. Toronto? Yes. Mr. Watkins? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. Okay. The August 13, 14, 2020 board meeting minutes are approved. Members, please mute your phone, your computers. I'm now moving to agenda item four, president's report. We have a new member with us today, and I would like to begin my report by introducing her and swearing her in. Uh oh, Miss Alejandro Campoverde was appointed on September 30th, 2020, by Governor Newsom. Ms. Campbell-Verde was a commissioner for First Five California from 2017 to 2019, managing editor of hashtag Emerging Us at the Los Angeles Times from 2014 to 2016, and was senior advisor for innovation and communication strategy at Univision from 2012 to 2014. Ms. Campbell-Verde held several roles in the White House from 20. Uh, 2009 to 2012, including Deputy Director of Hispanic Media and Special Assistant to the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy. She is the host of the podcast, Pod is a Woman, founded the Well Woman Coalition in 2018, and was the producer of the PBS health documentary, Inheritance, from 2018 to 2020. Ms. Campoverde is a member of the board of Harvard's Sorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, the California Community Foundation, and Harvard Kennedy School of Journal, Journal of Hispanic Policy. Ms. Campoverde earned a Master of Public Policy degree from Harvard University. And now I would like to swear her in today. Can you please raise your right hand and repeat after me? I, Alejandra <laughs> Campo Verde. Okay. I, Alejandra Campo Verde. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all en enemies, foreign and domestic. <laughs> Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance. And I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I will take this obligation freely. That I will take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. Great. Welcome, Ms. Campbell Verde. We are excited to have you on the board and look forward to your contribution. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. You can go back on mute. Our website, www.mbc.ca.gov, offers resources to licensees regarding waivers, extensions, um, and supervision requirements, among others, in response to COVID-19. The board's website also contains useful cures information for, for prescribing physicians, including prescribing and reporting rules that come into effect on January 1st, 2021. The board's summer 2020 newsletter, as well as the 2019-2020 annual report, are available to read and download on the board's website under publications. Are there any questions or comments from members on the president's report? I will now ask the host to call for public comments on the president's report. Thank you, Ms. Pines. I've <clears throat> excuse me. I've opened the Q&A window again. If anybody would like to make a public comment. Again, you can just type yes or anything in there, you know, brief and short, and we can call upon you to make your public comment.
Okay, Ms. Pines, at this time, I'm not seeing any, any requests. Okay, great. Let's move to agenda item five, board members communications with interested parties. Do any members have anything to report? Uh, please. Perhaps yeah. I do. Okay, please. Uh, in September, I received a uh, solicitation from David Serrano Sewell to uh, lend my name in support of the campaign for Proposition 14, uh, but I demurred, uh, fearing that that would uh, be taken as an implication of uh, medical board support. Uh, over the last few weeks, I've had some uh, communications with Dr. Ralph Delibero, who's the medical policy chief of Medi-Cal, who uh, wishes for the medical board to uh, have some involvement in uh, Medi-Cal's planned expansion of the use of a uh, medical diagnosis by uh, licensed uh, uh, family uh, therapists and uh, clinical social workers. And um, two weeks ago, I was contacted by the CMA uh, regarding the AB uh, 890 and had a uh, discussion uh, with them on that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pines, Dave Garner, Dave, I had uh, multiple conversations with multiple entities, including from, from CMA and, uh, and a couple of hospitals on 890. Just listen to them. That's about it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Ms. Pines, is Dr. Thoreau. Uh, just to, to um, say also that I have uh, had opportunity to speak with the staff at CMA regarding AB 890. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, great. Um, I will now ask for the host to call for public comments. We've activated the Q&A window again. If anybody would like to make a public comment, please indicate so. Okay, we have a request from Tay D. Solis. Give me a moment. Tay, are you there? Yes. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Tay Solis. I am from Bakersfield. I am one of 3,000 constituents that sent an email or signed letter to Senator Melissa Hurtado regarding our concerns with maternal health care in Kern County. For some reason, you forgot to mention that Sir Senator Melissa Hurtado sent you and Governor a letter citing our concerns and asking you questions pertaining to safe maternal health care in Kern County. We are not satisfied with your response. We want maternal health care project established in Kern County for Kern County to review and force statistics for OBGYNs. We will continue to work and educate our young mothers and we will continue to insist that you follow your mission of concerns and protection and provide transparency for Kern County patients. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Um, next up, Rosie Arthur's daughter, let me find you in the list. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, with the uh, communications issues, what's happening then is that your stakeholders are, your consumers are asking for things to be put on the agenda. Your, your board members are asking for things to be put on the agenda and it's being ignored. And this, you know, shouldn't be happening. So there, there needs to be some commitment by the board to put these things on the agenda when they're timely requested, especially when your board members ask for it. Um, so we also need to open up the task force for um, intractable pain patients. I'm just putting that as a category. That's been sorry, put on hold. We need um, that. We need that to go forward. I want to remind people of the agenda item. This is uh, public comments regarding board member communications with interested parties. Thank you. 
Okay, well, the board members did request this and it didn't happen. So I would think they would be interested in their requests not going forward. I couldn't reach them to talk to them. I tried to, but there's no way to communicate with them offline. Otherwise, I would have. But when they put it in the minutes that they want it on the agenda and it doesn't go on the agenda, I would think that they would be interested in it. So all I'm bringing up is that the board is not responsive even to their own members' requests, and it shouldn't take six years. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I don't see any other requests in queue. Great. Let's move to agenda item six, executive management report. Mr. Prasifka. Uh, Madam President, thank you very much. Uh, we have three parts to the uh, agenda item. I will try to be brief. You've had the report, and of course, we are happy to answer any questions. The first report is the administrative summary. Um, last period was a very busy period for the board. Uh, we want to welcome some new senior members of staff, Reggie Varghese. Well, he was here at the last board meeting, but since that time, we've uh, Welcomed on board Anita Joseph, who takes the post of staff service manager for the discipline coordination unit, as well as Danette McReynolds, who heads up the uh, staff services manager for the administrative services unit. Moving on to the budget update, of course, the board will be well aware of the very um, challenging financial circumstances that the board currently finds itself in. And the executive, of course, is monitoring its financial position uh, in a very careful way and as careful as possible. Uh, you should be noted that there has been some small marginal improvement in the board's position in terms of projections for the reserve that will be in place at the end of the year, going from 1.4 months to 2.3 months. A significant driver of that is our improved revenue position as will be noted later in the report, we are issuing more licenses than ever before in response to greater demand. That in general, of course, is a good thing, and it's beginning to have a positive outturn in terms of our revenue position, which has been rather static for, uh, for certainly the short and medium term. So that is something which will be noted, but of course, we will continue to monitor the budgetary position very carefully going forward. In terms of coronavirus updates, there were two waivers that were granted uh, in the intervening period in terms of postgraduate training license and physician and surgeon's licenses. Uh, those came through, uh, but it's been a very challenging time because we've had to issue uh, large numbers of licenses in a very time-bound manner. So we have done that uh, and we've been given waivers there well, I think we're coming to the point where we're looking to unwind the waivers and return to business as usual. And we're hoping to do that again in the medium term. In terms of external communications, uh, I gave a presentation to the Mid Valley chapter of the California Association of Medical Staff Services. We released the summer 2020 edition of the quarterly newsletter. We have published uh, the annual report and we maintain a very active uh, public profile on a number of different fora. Uh, in terms of remote working, again, we have invested significantly in hardware that will uh, promote teleworking and remote working going forward. We've had to invest substantially in our private, uh, in our virtual private network, giving us additional capacity and bandwidth as we have made more demands upon it. A very important part of our teleworking program has been the docs portal, which allows us to um, really review licenses and uh, documentation online, which is so important. And the report gives um, up-to-date information about the numbers of medical schools, 
uh, 92 medical schools in California, 422 postgraduate training uh, facilities, over 7,000 documents have been uploaded from 2,800 applicants. So again, this is an initiative that was taking place during COVID and it has been very welcome indeed. We are uh, refreshing the website. We are re redesigning the online complaint form. And at the, uh, in October and November of this year, we had WebEx training for our medical experts. And by all accounts, that went very well. Moving on to the enforcement program, I think we have some good news to report in terms of greater efficiencies in the meeting of uh, deadlines. And certainly the enforcement team is to be congratulated there. In terms of our own central complaint unit, the average number of days to initiate a complaint is now seven days. We're under the 10 days. This has been a very significant a target for us. And again, the team is to be congratulated for meeting that target under 10 days now on a very consistent basis. For me, even a greater uh, achievement was our central complaints unit was really targeting the older complaints, the complaints that had been with us for over a year. And certainly in terms of efficient complaint management, uh, that is vitally important. And during the last period, uh, the number of complaints over one year within our own CCU unit have decreased by 63%. And that is a very significant achievement uh, to Jenna Jones and to her team. And what it demonstrates is that for those areas of enforcement that are completely within our control, is that we're able to actively manage them and to bring about, I think, a very efficient result. Uh, uh, there continues to be work in our complaint investigation office uh, where we've received uh, many positive outcomes. The discipline coordination unit has certain vacancies there uh, and the probation unit does as well. But the performance enforcement measures and the charts attached, I think, tell a very interesting story. And I would just like to go through them very briefly. The first one, PM1, the complaints received, contrary to what a cursory indication would indicate, no complaints received have, have not fallen off the charts. What has happened is that for the most recent fiscal year, that's only a quarterly outturn. So on an annualized basis, we will be receiving something on the order of just over 10,000 complaints, which is very much in line with what we have been receiving to date. Um, PM2 is the complaint initiation time frame. Again, that is now under 10 days, and that is a very positive achievement. And it's something which we intend on keeping under 10 days. Moving on, if you look at the average days to complete complaints in the central complaint unit, I think because of the work that has been done in the last quarter in terms of clearing out many of the older cases, I think we will be seeing progress in that moving forward. Otherwise, uh, complaints average day to complete investigations and HQIU uh, remain marginally higher. Uh, one particular report that I want to do, want to point out to you, is the enforcement time frames. This is board paper 6B11. If you go to the total time that the AG has had working various complaints in the most recent uh, period in the current uh, uh, financial year 2021, it does indicate a significant uptick from the prior year of median times going from 354 days to 428 days and from average times of 374 to 419. As we explain in a memo that is the last section there, 
In fact, there has been no significant increase in processing times, but just our very astute team in ISB has noted that the previous figures were using a different metric in terms of measuring the time within the Attorney General's office. If we use the same metric, there would have been no increase in time whatsoever. But just going forward, we're using, if you will, a different baseline. So that explains what initially may have seemed to be a bit of an anomaly. But moving forward, we um, hope that we'll get a positive outcome on the basis of the new metric. Moving forward very briefly in terms of the licensing program review, board will remember from the last quarter is that what had happened is that there was a surge in terms of license applications of upwards of 74% in the last quarter of 2021 and there was a um there was a an increase in processing times uh, as was indicated in the last quarter uh, applications received was significantly in excess of license issues what we have done in the first quarter of this year is to really flip that around so we received 2,219 applications, and the licenses issued was 3,130. So for effectively every two applications received, we are issuing three licenses. So I think that is, um, that's what we set out to do. We wanted to certainly uh, change the whole dynamic there. Anytime you have a system where now we're issuing far more licenses than we are receiving, this does indicate in a very real substantial way that we are dealing with that backlog. Uh, the initial review reached a high point of 67 days, which is far in excess of where we had wanted it to be. But what we had to do, the staff was focusing on issuing licenses there were several intervening deadlines in relation to the issuing of PTL licenses and the physician and surgeon's licenses for which there were waivers granted requiring certain licenses to go to the top of the queue. So where we are today right now is that we have the initial review point of not 67 days, but of 54 days. Uh, we have now procedures in place, I think, to bring that down, we hope much more rapidly for the time of the next um, of the next board meeting. One of the issues that we've had is that the same people doing the initial review are the ones who are making the final determination. What is looking, what we're looking forward in the medium term is to have a dedicated unit doing the initial reviews, which should allow us to bring that number back down to historic levels. So again, I would report that we've made substantial progress in terms of the initial review, we have not made as much progress as I would have hoped, frankly, but I think we do have the processes and procedures in place. We're moving forward. We should be, again, issuing more licenses than we are receiving, and we're looking for that initial review time to come down uh, significantly moving forward. We have a list there of the COVID-19 updates, the PTL waiver and physician and uh, surgeon waiver, which I've already spoken about. And again, there's been a lot of progress made in terms of utilization of the docs portal and the consumer information unit. Um, I think maybe I will leave it at that and myself and the team would be happy to answer any questions that the board would have. Ms. Pines, uh, Dave Garnadale. Okay. Uh, Bill, I, I'm thrilled that uh, we are actually improving on the licensing side. I, I, I know that it was a perfect time with the three years on one side and PTL on the other and the COVID-19. Uh, it was a tough time, but I'm really glad to see the progress we are making. Uh, so that's, that's just a comment, but the, my question is, what are we doing to control the costs? I think we took care of the revenue by raising raising the dues. I'm wondering 
Are we doing something with the AG's office, HQIU? What are we doing to control the cost? Thank you. Yes, well, we are, th those are the critical areas in terms of cost going forward. The AG's office and the HQIU. In terms of the HQIU, what we are doing is we are more actively managing the cases at an initial stage. We are doing more substantial uh, uh, internal medical reviews led by Dr. Nuovo and deciding which cases go through to information, uh, uh, go through to the, uh, to the investigative unit. So we are trying to use those resources much more efficiently and effectively. And the same thing true with the AG's office. We are trying to resolve cases earlier. We are seeing where cases can be resolved without going through a full legal route, whether it's using letters, uh, public letters of reprimand or other types of settlement issues. So what we are effectively trying to do is to reduce our utilization of the HQIU and the Attorney General's office, knowing full well that there will always be a significant numbers of cases which require that level of detail, that level of legal attention in terms of the investigation or in terms of the legal formulation. So that's what we're trying to do. And we hope to report going forward that we have more efficient use of those two external bodies. But that's really the best metric that we have in terms of controlling cost going forward. Great, oh, thanks, Jim. This is Peter Walken. Hi, I have a question. I've got a few questions. My first question is, as steaming along, you know, and looking for these efficiencies, so that's, we, we're chasing numbers here. My concern is the public protection part in that. Since the enforcement is the most important part, one of the next to licensing, the most important functions of the board, I'm concerned that we don't fall into the trap. And the trap being that we wanna use a public letters of reprimand as a way to clear complex cases because we don't want to utilize HQI, we don't wanna utilize the attorney general's office. My question is, how do you quality, qualitatively, in terms of maintaining the standard, manage this without deviating that a case that suddenly needs probation that goes down to a public reprimand because it may be too difficult, it may even be too expensive? Because the risk with chasing efficiency is that we lose the mandate. And I just wanna hear your response to that. Yeah, well, uh, the one thing is I can give yourself and the board assurance that that is not what we were doing. In the last period, um, I have to tell you, I mean, before I came here, I was four and a half years as the uh, chief executive of the medical board, uh, medical council of Ireland. Just in the past quarter, I have, we have reviewed a small number of cases that are the most horrific and egregious violations of professionalism and patient safety that I have ever come across in my career. So I would indicate to you that we are completely dedicated here to using all available resources and um, all of our expertise to deal with those most serious cases. And there will be no compromise in terms of looking for an easy win, uh, you, know, uh, you know, whatever that means, when the patient safety and public protection demands a much more serious sanction. And I'm very keen that this board have a very full regulatory toolkit so we can deal with different cases appropriately, but it is all contingent upon the executive, 
being completely committed to taking the hard cases and where appropriate, using all of our resources to get very serious sanctions. And that is what we must do. Now, look, we live in a world of reality. We have bills to pay. There are scarce resources. But I can assure you that when we look at the most serious cases, and again, we have a small number of cases that are extremely serious, there will be no compromise. We will not shy away from using resources where appropriate to get sanctions which are necessary to protect the public. Well, thank you, Bill. And this the a lighter question. I just want to make sure, since we put you in this position, that want to know how you're doing. How are you adjusting to California? I know that's not enforcement, but you are central figure running this organization show for us on the ground, so to speak. And I just want to check in with you and see that you, as a person, Bill is okay. Thank you. Well, I must say. Um... I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well personally since the last board meeting. With your uh, assistance, I have a personal trainer. And if I did not have a mask on, the board members would realize that right now I'm eight kilos lighter than I was at the last board meeting. So thank you very much. And your, uh, all of your good work and your assistance is much appreciated. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the, the report? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Persiska, um, and congratulations again on getting the initial complaint process down to seven days, a reflection of the strong enforcement team uh, that you have there, and as well as on um, the work you're doing with uh, the licensing numbers. We appreciate that. I'm now going to ask the host to call for public comments. Okay, I've gone ahead and opened up the Q&A window if anyone would like to make a public comment. First up, we have Eric Andrus. Let me open your line. Eric, are you there? I'm here. Please go ahead. Okay, guys, I have a lot to say, so I'm going to read really fast. Just cut me off if I have my time runs out. How did the older complaints decrease? They just closed with no investigations like so many others are, or were they thrown in the trash like all those thousands of complaints were in 1993? And we have documentation of terrible cases over the years that have been given public letters of reprimand. Remember Tim and Tammy Smith coming in and talking to you about how a doctor killed their son and Dr. Ron Lewis signed off on giving him a public letter of reprimand. So don't think for a minute that we're not watching these cases. And if we continue to see bad cases being given public letters of reprimand, we're going to bring it to your attention. Thanks, TJ, for bringing that up. Since you brought up, uh, wait a minute, I've been too busy to go through the annual report, but I will definitely do so before the sunset review as I'm positive there are discrepancies to be noted as there has been in the past. I did see though that the deficit in the board member payouts of $44,500, which is more than double what you budgeted. Remember, I did several public record requests asking for a detailed itemization board members were claiming they were running up these costs and each time the request was illegally not fulfilled when i pointed that out to carrie webb she just clammed up oh but remember public record act requests are none of the board's business according to carrie webb i still have at least two pending requests regarding board member payouts that were improperly handled this too will be brought up in our sunset review report i do have a question though which i know will go unanswered under revenues, I don't see a line item for all of the money you're making on the exorbitant sales of public record requests. Does that fall under miscellaneous, which says $4 for 2019-2020? I know for a fact that news organizations are paying a lot more than that for information via public record requests. So where is that money in the revenue totals, or is that and other money being hidden from these reports. In that same vein, what line item includes monies paid out for the board to defend itself in lawsuits by disgruntled doctors and or the public? 
is not just lumped in among attorney general services. I saw no mention of it in the annual report either. Any other board members curious about why this about this and why the sum is being hidden? I'm thrilled to hear though that the website design is being brought up to ADA standards. That only took three years. That's better than your disciplinary guide timelines. However, the time by the time that the redesign is completed, it'll be almost four years. Both Julie D'Angelo Felmuth and I mentioned it at the October 2017 meeting that the font on the website was way too small and very hard to read, let alone those with vision problems. It's in the minutes, you can check. This is an extremely easy change for a technician to have made, but here we are three years later with no font changes. This is how much you guys care about our input, requests, and your duty to make sure that consumers are served. I have a lot more, but I'm gonna try and fit it in elsewhere, thanks. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Tay D. Solis. Let me open your line. Tay, are you there? Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Hi, again, it's Tay um, from Bakersfield. There is a doctor on probation in Bakersfield who is currently breaking probation. We have reported the violations to the probation monitor who claims this is not her job. Can you please inform me that what the probation monitor's job is? Well, the probation monitor is claiming that it is not her job that she is referring me to the investigator. The investigators are continue, this, the violations are continuing in Kern County. Women and babies are continually being harmed. So again, what is the probation monitor's job? Thank you. Please hear our voices in Bakersfield. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Amanda Kessner. Let me open your line. Okay. Amanda, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, my name is Amanda. I'm calling from Berkeley, California. I'm a licensed midwife. And I support a licensed midwife board, and I'm thanking the board for approving this under the sunset review legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Marianne Hollingsworth. Marianne, let me find here. Marianne Hollingsworth, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marion Hollingsworth and I'm a patient safety advocate. Well, it's encouraging to hear that the enforcement division is working to lower the amount of time spent on cases. Your own statistics in the annual report show that it takes an average of three years to complete a complaint from start to finish. Some complaints take even longer. Although Mr. Pacifica is claiming you are being tough on egregious cases, we are finding ones that are getting off with reprimands. You, and this is because you're not following your own disciplinary guidelines. For example, your guidelines say that any sexual misconduct carries a recommended minimum of seven years probation. Yet this year you give a Fresno doctor just a public reprimand for repeated unwanted sexual misconduct with two colleagues. Gross negligence carries a recommended five-year probation according to your guidelines. Yet this year you gave a public reprimand to two doctors who were both found responsible for the death of a baby during childbirth. These were two separate cases, each of which resulted in the death of a baby. One case was back in 2013. It took that long to resolve it. And thank you to Mr. Watkins for bringing up this issue of reprimands for being used in egregious cases. Also, your discipline rate is the lowest it has been in at least five years. Usually the percentage of doctor discipline hovers around four to almost 5%. This year, however, your annual report shows your discipline rate fell to about three and a half percent, 3.7 to be exact, during the last fiscal year. So basically, you don't follow your own disciplinary guidelines. Your, your discipline rates are consistently lenient and it takes years to resolve. And, and you're, at the same time, your discipline rate is falling. How is this helping public safety? Perhaps your board members can review this and work to improve your approach on discipline so patients are not put at risk from potentially dangerous doctors. Uh, also, thank you to Mr. Watkins for your condolences. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Rosie, author's daughter. Let me unmute your line. 
Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. And let me explain. Arthur's daughter is my Swedish surname. So I'm Rosie. My father's name is Arthur, Arthur and I am his daughter. So that explains why that strange name is there. Anyway, uh, I'd like to comment on um, item 6A at technology updates. In the last week or so, I've been having to navigate your site and have discovered that, as is frequently the case, it is not ADA compliant, anywhere near ADA compliant. And it's not just a matter of, oh, we haven't gotten to it yet. But uh, there's some very specific things. Um, things like minutes aren't where you would expect to find them. They're just simply unlabeled and you're lucky to find them if you if you do find them. Um, items that should be, uh, there should be transcripts. Now, when you have closed captions on a webinar and the time date stamps, it's just an easy matter of running that and bam, you have that information there available for people who have any number of disabilities, as well as for the convenience of the general public and your staff. Makes it easy to go to a part, you can search for a word or whatever you need to do in that transcript that is already a part of the, the closed captioning system. And that should be uh, in place for everything that you have on the site. Um, then there is the ability to manipulate the actual digital platform uh, for uh, ADA interpretation and such. So if you go into a, a document online in the original format, if you copy something and paste it, then you have to go in and manually insert the spaces between each and every character where there's a space between the words. So it makes it very difficult. Or you have to go into and manually stop it, read the closed captioning, write it down, go back, and then it takes a long time to find something or to make a record. Um, if you go into the PDF documents, they're not opened up so that you can copy it. Doesn't mean that you're gonna change what's in the, the document, but to be able to copy what's in there and paste it elsewhere, you can't do it. So these documents have to be consistently built there so that they can be utilized by the public in general, by your staff, and by people who have to use uh, different forms of digital manipulation to those documents in order to have access to the information. Then number B, the expert reviewer program. There are a number of places where they do not have access to the sources the laws, etc., that they need. So, and sometimes the source is there, sometimes it's gone. And it's inconceivable that, you know, in this day and age, that you'd be deleting things that are. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I don't see any more public comments, Ms. Banks. Okay, great. Moving to the next item, which is item seven. Discussion and possible action on approval of the sunset review report. Mr. Prasivka. Okay, um, we're uh, on the on to the sunset report. First of all, I have to say I want to congratulate the staff for putting together what was an absolutely Herculean task to bring it in um, on time uh, while still doing their day job and maintaining activity levels was a very challenging project, but we're very happy to have brought it to this point. And of course, we did it with the very active involvement of the president and the vice president in terms of the sunset review team. Uh, the board will be pleased to know that I have no intention of going through the entire document at this point, uh, however much I know you would enjoy that. But what I would like to do is very briefly focus on just three parts of the document, that's sections 10, 11, and 12, basically the COVID-19 section, looking at the prior issues and looking, I think most importantly, at the new issues going forward. And I would just like to speak very briefly to those three points. And then again, we're very anxious, the executive to hear from the rest of the board and to receive your direction. At the end of the day, we have to submit the final document. Uh, I believe it's the 1st of January. So we have some time to take on board comments. Um, 
and uh, to make a final document. In terms of section 10, the board's action and responses to COVID-19, as the board is very well aware, and as they have been informed this year, has been a very challenging time for the medical board and frankly for medical boards everywhere. Because a lot of what we do is very labor intensive, it's very paper intensive, it requires a lot of uh, interactions and um, with the with COVID and the requirements there, we've had to, to a significant extent, reinvent ourselves in the way that we do everything from board meetings to the way that we review licenses to the way that we interact with external stakeholders. Uh, significant investments have been made in teleworking. And as of right now, we have 94 staff who are working under teleworking agreements. We have 164 laptops with the uh, docking stations. All of our significant amount of technology investment going forward is all there to uh, facilitate remote working. But to have gone through all of this and to have maintained activity levels is a credit to the staff, to their ingenuity, to their agility, to their flexibility, and that is so critical. Now, we've been assisted in this by a series of waivers which have been granted to us. We've worked very closely with DCA. As indicated, all the waivers that we sought have been granted. Waivers that we have been granted are very similar to waivers that other boards have been granted because we're working in a different environment. But again, we're looking to the point now where we think we can begin to unwind some of these waivers and go back to business as usual. So again, I think the board has been very proactive in response to COVID. We've had to reinvent a lot of what we have been doing and uh, I think that the outturn, generally speaking, has been quite successful, but it has been very challenging. Looking at section 11, the board action and response to prior sunset issues, I found this to be a very interesting part of the report because it sets out a very compelling social history on what the medical board has been up to, not just in the most recent period, but really going back 10 years and longer. And I think there are lots of very important points that emerge from looking at this section of the document. The first is that there are a significant number of issues that have been identified in the past where the board has made certain proposals that it felt were needed to improve its operations and those operations and those proposals have been largely accepted, sometimes wholly accepted, but largely accepted. Going through recommendations that were made, for example, about the need to improve penalties in terms of mandatory reports, about revoking licenses for sex offenders, about uh, the medical board's ability to receive complaints and reports about respondents' expert witnesses to be more timely in terms of public notice of disciplines, to be able to um, change the way panel memberships were constituted, uh, and the notice to consumers about uh, information of licensees. These and a host of other things have been resolved and resolved to the satisfaction of the medical board. And that is a testament to the leadership in the past and the ability to build relationships with other aspects of the public service. So that gives us a very strong foundation. And as we look forward to initiatives in the future, we know that we should be able to build on the work and successes that we have had in the past. There are a number of other items there which indicate that there's been a significant amount of continuity um, and that we've dealt with issues as we've dealt with issues, we've learned things, and the organization has grown. So, for example, issue number two talks about the need to have data sharing relationships with other bodies. Um, a very important relationship there has been with the California Department of Public Health in terms of monitoring uh, 
uh, opioid overdoses and the transmittal of death certificates. That project was started as part of a data sharing agreement. And we are now, just now, as we'll talk about more tomorrow, in the position to relaunch that project. So this is one that began with the prior issue of the need to share data. We have had some success in terms of using that project. We have learned from our experience and we will relaunch it, we hope a new improved uh, version of that project. And again, it shows to me a lot of continuity there and we're building upon our achievements. And that is very important. Issue number nine, looking at the physician health and wellness program. Again, there was a prior diversion program, which was terminated in 2008. And so there has been a lot of work looking at redesigning a new program to deal with some of the deficiencies that we're seeing in the prior program. And we're at the stage right now where we have developed regulations under the legislation. Those are with DCA at the moment. And the Physician Health and Wellness Program will be a very important component of our increased regulatory toolkit going forward. Um, of course, uh, the, the whole issue regarding international medical schools and the PTL was something which is very actively monitored in, pri in, in, uh, in previous time. And now with the introduction of the PTL, we have a whole new set of issues that have been challenging to us. But again, it's filled a very important gap in our regulatory toolkit. And we look forward to dealing with those challenges and uh, uh, using it to the fullest potential. One item which I thought was particularly interesting in the prior issues was issues number six, but well, sorry, was issue 26, where it says that there were delays in dealing with complaints and there were the need to streamline enforcement. Well, the more things change, the more they remain the same. But I think what is so very important is that we're dealing with this issue of delay with a fresh set of eyes, with, we hope, a fresh set of regulatory options, with a commitment absolutely to dealing with each case appropriately, not taking shortcuts, not looking for cheap victories when, of course, patient safety demands it. But by dealing with the complaints as a whole, the goal is to reserve more resources for the most important cases, not to take the easy option out. So again, I think we've learned a lot about dealing with complaints since, uh, uh, since where we were 10, 15 years ago. So the important thing is really to build on that. And then the last section I want to talk about are the new issues which we have which we have identified. We have deliberately tried to keep those to a manageable level, to look for those things which are absolutely necessary. We have engaged with others in terms of building these proposals. We want to particularly thank the Attorney General's Office for contributions in terms of item number four or five. But just very briefly, the board will know that the budgetary position of, of the board is a very difficult and a very challenging one. We are looking at very structural deficits rising in the near term, and there is a need for a fee increase. But the fee increase, of course, is not in isolation. We're also looking for substantial improvements of efficiency going forward, and that's something to keep in mind. We're looking to achieve cost recovery. We're looking to have more flexibility in terms of how we staff our investigators. Uh, through the Attorney General's office, we're looking for certain enhancements of our subpoena power and inspection power so that we can operate much more efficiently. And we're looking to both utilize existing tools of non-adversarial enforcement and some additional ones as well. Uh, so again, we've tried to keep them simple. We've, we've tried to maintain a focus and uh, we look forward to hearing from the board and to give us any directions so that we can bring this project through 
um, to completion by 1 January. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so can I have a motion to approve the sunset re review report and authorize staff to work on the sunset review um, task force to finalize this report for the legislature? And then we can move into discussing reports. So we initially have a motion to approve and a second, and then we'll move to member comments, questions um, from the team. So move. Dr. Hawkins. Okay. So let's let's dive in. I know we have to have let's do this. Okay. <laughs> TJ, you want to start? Sure. Why okay. not? I just got 20 pages. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is a, a you know, I read, the, I read the report and I read the previous report as well. And I thought that I should uh, bring everybody, you know, Denise, you were in the room. Dr. Garnadev was in the room at the last sunset review. Right, and it was an interesting opportunity. That's actually the reason why I wanted to be on the medical board. Truth be told, because I had a question back then. Why are there 50 plus almost 100 people standing here and none of them have a good thing to say about the board? Right? And this is the I like riddles. This is 1 of the riddles. So the report there's nothing wrong with the report except that it lacks 1 thing. And it's actually the most important thing. And that thing is the legislature is going to ask 1 question. And that question, this is why the sunset review is important. It's an opportunity for us to look in the mirror. And the question that they will ask is, did we protect the public to the best of our ability? Now, if we go to our stakeholders, we go to the associations and all of them, they will probably sign off because we did surveys and we do get the surveys and they are responding, right? But then when we get to the actual sunset review hearing, the public show up and the public show up with their grievances and they show us our blind spot. And this is what's missing in this report is that we have an opportunity and I'm optimistic about the opportunity that it represents because I think we have all the right people in place to present something that we can come in with enhanced ways of addressing public issues. I don't even need to go further or go into where I wanted to go. I can just go into comments that are made. Communication with the public in a spirit of, you know, good faith communication back and forth, taking recommendations. These are some of the issues that are missing out of this report coming from the public, specifically the public, not our stakeholders. We have enough of that. And so what I suggest, and what I suggest very strongly is that the legislature are going to ask us very difficult questions. They're going to ask us difficult questions about enforcement, the use of our various tools, the very issues that I raise about reprimands, about uh, following the guidelines, all these things are important. They don't seem that important when we do the day to day because we are in it. Well, Mr. Pacifica is more in it than I am on a daily basis. We just review cases. So my, que my suggestion is that we include into this report something of a reflective on us that delineates two things our commitment to listen to our to the public and when we and practices specifically when the public is affected by the doctors or the doctors that we have as our licensees that they be given the due process. One of my uh, continual challenges is when a reprimand is made and someone mentioned uh, there, someone dies, 
if we appear like we don't have any compassion because we just make a determination, ah, this happens every day as a, as a doctor. But guess what? This doesn't happen every day to normal people. When they lose a child, when they lose a spouse, that is not okay. We, we, we do not have, a, we need more empathy in the medical board. Now that sounds like it's a funny word to be using in a regulatory body, but it's the very thing that the legislature is looking for. They are asking, are you sensitive to the public's needs? And so I'm just gonna leave it there and let everybody else chip in and see where everybody's at. Thank you. Dr. Hawkins, may I speak? Yes. Uh, a lot of different things, but I'm just gonna ask, ask a couple. And one was under section 10, which is COVID, section 10, number 72, as a board recognizing necessary statutory revisions, et cetera. And one of the things in that part is that uh, there's a state that the board would welcome a change in the Open Meeting Act to allow meetings to continue to be conducted via an online platform for various reasons. And often it's mentioned, and I really want, I want public comment on this when they, uh, when they can speak, if someone will. That often I'm meeting the public says, well, you know, you know, it costs a lot to come to your meeting. There's a travel cost, there's a accommodation cost. Um, you pick places that are less, less expensive. And so my question is, I wonder how this would be received by the public if we had less in-person meetings once we get past coronavirus. We will eventually, it's gonna take some time though. How is that, how would that be perceived? Less in-person meetings and more on the phone meetings like we're doing now, virtual meetings. Uh, that's more of a question uh, for the public. Uh, under section 12, and I don't mean I have the answer to all these questions, section 12, number two, restoring cost recovery. We know that physicians can't get off probation if they don't pay all their fees. And I, so I, I'm sure they pay their fees because they want to get off probation. But I'm wondering, uh, restoring cost recovery, uh, how likely we are to get money from that, substantial amounts of money. And, and I realize we may have to have that. And the third has to do with the, the same, this is in, that's in section 12, 12 number two, has to do with the midwifery. And I hope there'll be an opportunity to talk about that. Uh, members, members of the mid, uh, advisory, advisory council uh, feels that the board does not adequately represent, and there were some comments earlier about um, whether there's adequate uh, experts with licensed midwives uh, in terms of discipline. And one thing I make about that, because we had a conversation earlier about discipline, licensed midwives, it was very difficult to get licensed midwives to act as experts to make comments about, to really to, to uh, act as experts for the board uh, for their their colleagues, so midwifery, um, what the board, what the the uh, public thinks about um, more virtual in the future, when we are are able to uh, uh, go back to in person, and the third was about um, recovery, and I realize I may not be uh, uh, answer these questions now, although I would like the input from the the public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, additional board members? Don't be you. Go ahead. You have the floor? Yep, you have the floor. Great. I was curious about the process for um, prior sunset issues, um, specifically issue 25, which was disparity and enforcement action. Um, I, are these issues continued to be prioritized into the new issues? Because looking at what the last investigation had through 2013, it looked like it did find that there were complaints, investigations, and discipline that found a correlation between physician race and um, disciplinary action, specifically for Latino physicians. And so, you know, this is obviously an issue. I know that it says we're having in-person training and web training every two years. But since the last study went through 2013, and this is obviously an issue that um, there's been many years since that, do these automatically get moved into being prioritized to be tracked and continue to be worked on? Or what happens to these prior sunset issues? 
That's a good question. Um, Mr. Krasivka, do you want to uh, comment on and provide any update as to where we are? One with the training and how the training has been conducted. Um, and two, future measurement uh, to see if the training and what we put into place is actually becoming effective. And my comment is obviously if this is not, if that's not the process, I'd like to um, recommend to elevate that to continue on to be tracked. Yes, yeah. well, I can certainly comment in terms of the training. You know, we have a very active set of training in terms of the issues of uh, implicit bias uh, organized both by ourselves and by the greater network. I was on a course with, I think, literally hundreds, uh, just a few, uh, uh, just a few uh, weeks ago. Um, I'm not aware of any updates in terms of looking at the outturns and the efficiencies and uh, the improvements uh, as a result of this. I think that's something that we will have to uh, undertake. In terms of how this um, will, how it, how it will go forward, I think that depends very much on the legislature in terms of what issues that they are going to want to uh, look at. The uh, Sunset Report itself is voluminous. Uh, it's a template that we did not invent. It's one that we were given. Um, but then the real issue is going to be of, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of issues there, which are the ones that are going to be the focus of the legislature. And so what we will be doing is working very closely with the legislature, with the staff there, who we have already developed relations with, uh, to be given a heads up on what are the particular issues that they're going to want us to testify for in greater detail. So that's, if you will, a work in progress that will commence once we have given them the final report and we will be engaging uh, with them. Um, I wonder, uh, Carrie, did you have any comments you wanted to make on this point. Sure, I'd also like to point out that in addition to the trainings that we go to through regarding implicit bias, um, the board has made changes in how the enforcement matters are presented in um, that references that can be stripped that may contribute to implicit bias are stripped from the investigators report and the accusation and the um, proposed decisions and proposed stipulations that come before the board uh, if if everyone is being compliant with, with what the board put forward. And so this is references to um, where the person went to medical school, postgraduate training, um, age and um, uh, whether they're board certified also. So it, it's something that staff and board members have continued interest in. And uh, if there's going to be further studies, that that is a big undertaking and the board would have to uh, direct staff to do that. Um, so that's where we are right now. Pines, may I make a brief comment, Dr. Hawkins? Yes. So one thing after um, we went through the initial um, bias training, uh, uh, follow-up was, was asked about uh, criticisms, what we thought. And I think that part of the consensus was that there was a need to uh, get another uh, individual or group to conduct that training because uh, several of us felt that there would be that uh, several eyes were not dotted and T's not crossed regarding implicit bias. Mm -hmm. so there, was, there was an acknowledgement that there was need to do a better job with this. And that's always valuable. Okay. Uh, oh. Any additional comments? Uh, Dr. Yip? Hi, comments and uh, suggestions. First, um, thanks for the uh, hot work putting in it. 
Um, one is that I think the board member who arrived after the last sunset really should read this from page one to page 300 because it's like a textbook telling you the history, what's going on with the board, <clears throat> which you may not even hear on, um, during the board meeting. If you have a time like TJ, even read the last report. The second is that um, we are not the only one involved in the board, the board member, the staff and all that. You know, in addition, the um, the public member, the um, uh, the AG office, the HQ, are they all involved? I strongly suggest that each party really read it um, and suggest the staff to read it. When you look at the, I'm trying to I'm trying to fish out the section. Uh, I try to read the whole thing for the past few days. There's a section on consumer survey. We did so bad, shockingly bad that I'm so embarrassed. Those those. Those, those percent of this distress so high and maybe bias, but then I think people from answering the phone to the level one, level two staff, to the manager, I think each one of us should read the report because we all contribute to the function of the medical board. Um, the survey says that we may think we do the right thing, but our audience, the public reserve, they don't think we do the right thing. When you look at the when you, when the board member whoever is in the room now, um, uh, go back to the report and look at the consumer survey. We did so bad. Um, it, it's just something I think we need to really read it. Uh, the, the AG office, the DAG, the HQ, the, the investigator, the, the the monitor. Everyone should read it and and ask ourselves how can we do better. It's just not Bill. It's just not Denise. It's just not me alone. We all get to think how can we do better. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a I, great recommendation. I want to follow up with that yeah, because I think that is that is exactly the issue that the legislator is going to ask of us. They they were interested in 2016 about how are we better protecting the public? How what have we done effort wise? So if you look at the 2016 report, right? And you read this report and you go back, you see the, the issues kind of reemerge. And what we see all the time is that we do pretty bad, like Dr. Yepa said, we we we're not doing great in the in serving our customers, so to speak, which is the public. And we hear that in these board meetings. And it's okay to say, okay, we'll address it. It's different when we're standing at the uh, business and professions committee uh, in, in their chambers and having this conversation with a hundred people. That's why I suggested we have this difficult conversation now. And really, part of this includes some of our ideas, some of the admissions that we didn't do great in this. And so, so that's a big thing to admit that we could do better. We have done amazing in many of the issues, bringing it forth every time, but we can do better. That's what I'm optimistic about. My other issue here was, you know, I would just want to talk about the cost recovery because for me, it always feels like this is dead on arrival as an issue. I hate to say it, but it's the truth. It's dead on arrival because how we got this cost recovery removed and what its implications are. The implications are that right now we're spending 70, 80% of our budget on enforcement. So people feel, and this is for the doctors, that they feel emboldened to take on a legal process because they're not gonna pay for it. This is not gonna be dismissed with costs. Yet for every one of us that has been in legal proceeding, when we sit down with an attorney, they explain to us, if this gets dismissed in the civil matter, you're gonna pay them. And that is also what the doctors, what the doctors and the CMA, when they lobbied for this, had in mind. But it's actually unfair to the public who does not have that level of representation, whose case and their due process can end within a month or six months with a reprimand. And that's not okay. That's not okay because perhaps we, we, we have two uh, experts that do not agree. So 
someone is getting more due process and yet we say we protect the public. We need to look at that because the, way, the scales for public protection is not even. In fact, the law uh, uh, lays out that if those things are at an equal level, the public protection part outweighs the doctor's interest part. And I'm not sure that that part happens all the time. In fact, I'm confident it doesn't happen all the time. The, whole, the way we have structured this, and we're trying to correct this with the Sunset Report, is to just even it one step at a time. And so the cost recovery request is a very real request. Because once the doctor has that burden to decide that for themselves, taking on this legal action, it will stop the frivolousness of it and eating away precious time that our staff could be really investigating serious matters. So that's my Do you have any additional comments on any of the recommendations? Um, any suggested changes to any of those recommendations? Any questions about the past issues? Uh, Ms. Pice, uh, Dr. I have a question. Uh, well, one thing I think with the licensed midwives is we need to carefully structured in such a way that it models the nurse midwives last year if the legislature passed, if we are putting that in sunset, if they are doing a separate bill, their own, that's different. So that's why I just wanted to point out. We, did, we supported that last year, the nurse midwife one. Okay. Um, there was someone that was wanted to make a comment. Was that Lori? Yes, please. Uh, question for clarification as well as a, a quick comment. And the question goes to board members who were involved in Sunset before, perhaps Bill as well. I, I was wondering with the with the presentation of the issues, you know, number one and ascending is is that. Is that in order of our prioritization? Does that mean anything in the in the, the order it's presented? That's one question. And also, um, when we present the issues uh, at sunset, do we get feedback on what that prioritization should be? Yeah. Maybe Aaron is also part of that. Communication with the PMP committees. Uh, uh, can I come in here? Yes. Uh, yeah, just to say to answer the question directly. No, uh, the order there, there is no uh, particular order, um, and we obviously would welcome direction from um, uh, from the board uh, about that. Uh, no, there there is no. Uh, I mean, maybe they should be, frankly, in order of priority, and that would be a good thing. And we, we would welcome the feedback from the board as to what that should be. And Bill, uh, you remember, well, you don't remember last sunset, I think if they group them in areas and it's not any order, it's what the committee feels is important during the discussion, but they don't prioritize them in 2000. 16 rev, they didn't prioritize them, so. Uh, Denise, uh, so as the person who went to last sunset and you and I, mm -hmm. uh, there was no priority. They just to throw, the, throw some things at you and you want to, they want you to answer. So, yes. but, but Bill, I think uh, if we can, it's a great idea. So, but, uh, but yeah. they, they- I think it's a good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They I agree with you. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it's a good idea to prioritize them, even though that's not historically um, that's happened in the last two sunsets um, that I can remember. Um, but I think it's a good idea to prioritize them. Um, we know what's most important um, that we're trying to achieve. And so having said that, let's first continue with um, other comments from members, and then let's go to the to that section of the document and look at prioritizing those. I do have a question about some additional information to add. 
to um, the section on uh, of past issues uh, on vertical enforcement, and it's on. Let me see where it's at. Uh, it's issue twenty number twenty seven. Um, so page one ninety. Um, we we sort of end with just one statement that we got this Senate bill um, and VE was eliminated. But I think what I would like to see here, because VE had such a large cost component for us, is to put something, um, some final notation in here of either we had a cost savings of XYZ or we had a cost increase of XYZ at this point in time of this document. I think that's going to be really important um, given the fact that VE was a very expensive undertaking and now that we don't have it, um, is are we spending more money as a result of not having it or have we actually saved money as a result of not having it? So we should have a final notation on this because cost is discussed in the issue. Denise, I have a very general question when we have a, I, and I don't know if we want to take it later or if you want to go through this prioritization now. Um, let me just see if there's any other board member that has any other questions on anything with regards from COVID, um, past issues, and the current recommendations. Do we have any further discussion um, to add on either, even a new recommendation? This is Lori. I just I had a quick comment. Okay. Thank you. I I, I just wanted to to add that I do support uh, some sort of prioritization or or bundling to the extent we can present it uh, in in an easier manner, and then also where it's relevant and we are making an ask. Um, perhaps we make that clear, or you know that this is the ask, this is the goal, or um, just to help spoon feed the information. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, why don't we, if there's no additional comments, why don't we move to looking at the recommended um, changes and prioritizing those? So we're on section 12. Um, uh, Uh, and looking, um, do we all agree that increasing the board fees to maximize reserve amount is pretty monumental to this board remaining? Can we say that is a priority number one? Yes. Yeah, I agree. That would be yes. critical for the board to stay to stay solvent. Um, we need to. We need we at least temporarily have a that needs to be an initial strategy at least not the only one necessarily but it needs to be an initial one okay uh the next one we have as number two is restoring cover cost recovery um i think that's kind of connected to the first one so we may want to keep that um positioned here denise I, can I make yes. a comment on these? Um, I mean, with it would be perhaps advisable to somehow bundle these under like a subheading of financial stability measures or that sort of thing. And and I just wonder if um, I mean it feels those are of course critically important to our ongoing um, well our our ability to remain ongoing right, <laughs> right. Um, as, a, yes. as a regulatory <laughs> agency, but I. You know, things like investigators back to the board um, really go to our mission. So I, I just wonder whether we we could bundle these in some sort of subheadings because while it, while the financial stability of the board is of course important, our mission is you know public protection. And so I, I just don't want it to get lost if we're asking first for money, right? <laughs> Um, and then asking for some of these other things, which actually are probably at the same level of priority or importance. They're just really in different, different buckets. Okay. 
Um, also asking for the uh, investors to come back also is a financial issue, right? We would actually be saving money with them coming back. So, um, but I think the stronger argument is on the effectiveness of the enforcement. So, um, uh, is everyone open to having maybe two, three categories that these recommendations would fit under? Okay. Um, so let's put the uh, bill in Aaron. Um, can you weigh on suggested language that would be appropriate for the legislators? Sure, yeah, we can work on that. I mean, it does seem that you have issues of financial stability. Then there's the um, effectiveness of the enforcement. Um, I think that lends itself obviously uh, you know, four, five, six, all go, I mean, really, I think three, four, five, and six all go to, you know, making enforcement more effective. Okay. Uh, and, tar and, and really targeting in effectively on our mission, which is public protection and patient safety. Okay. And to some extent, seven as well. Yeah, let's see seven. And uh, I think eight, uh, eight, nine, and ten become miscellaneous <laughs> to clean up. Yeah. Uh, let's come with the something better than miscellaneous <laughs> and clean up. Um, Madam President, yes, please. This is Aaron. I, I, I think those those last three um, really that's a, that's a licensure bucket to me. That those are you know changes to our licensing program. Midwifery, if they're going to have a new board, that would change the licensing program. Research psychoanalysts going to board of um, psychology, and then the various licensing enhancements, cleanup. So perhaps, um, you know, licensure improvements or enhancements might be a, an appropriate name for those final three. Okay, great. Okay, so I think we have our three buckets that those will fit under. Um, do we want to keep them in the order that it appears as if they're going to go under? Yeah, I think that's okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Do we have any final comments from the board members before I go to the public? Section 12. Section 12. Yeah. Okay. What would you like to discuss? So some of these, I would also trust Aaron and staff and Bill also to look at orders and and order the order. You know, we don't need to sit here with the minutia. And they're also capable of doing that. So. Um, we have three buckets and they can play with the areas in the buckets. Okay, I think we kind of went through those. I think I think we're I think we're comfortable with what fits into those buckets. Yes, three buckets, right. Okay. Um, are there any um, final uh, comments? Uh, any final recommended changes? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So um, thank you to Dr. Hoffman for the past context. I, I want to go back to my previous comment, you know, in looking at what was said about the, the implicit bias and disparities. You know, it did say that the last study that there weren't definite conclusions regarding um, the drivers and scope. So I do think it would be appropriate when we're looking at, I don't I know there's not an ongoing potential issue section. But to, you know, potentially include a recommendation to commission another study. I have a comment. Um, have, have you seen or would like to see the study that was done on at the request of the Golden Gate Medical Association? Because they requested the study years ago and then the board carried it out. 
I'm, I'm going off of what is written in the sunset review. Yeah, because there's a whole study that we did. We, we had an outside source. So if you're interested, we can pull that up. Yes, Ms. Um, uh, Campo Verde, I recommend that you uh, read the report that was done. Um, that was a pretty extensive report. Anything that would be additional in terms of those drivers that they weren't really able to uh, reveal was going to be something that was going to cost uh, much more significant money in order to do that, uh, given the time frame that the report was covering. What I would suggest is that we give um, the process that we are in right now, which is the implicit bias training, a number of things that we've put in place um, in terms of um, uh, cases that we receive and how we actually receive those cases, um, the, uh, the, the breadth of which the training is covering, not just um, the board, but uh, the DAGs and the judges, um, to give that a, 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 a process to actually have change occur and then come back probably in the next 18 months to look at it, a potential evaluation. It, this Howard, may I speak to that? Yes. So the report uh, that we've been discussing was one that we commissioned from the California Review Board and it was published in January 2017, uh, subsequent to which we made these changes uh, that you uh, noted regarding implicit bias training. Uh, and we did discuss when we established that in 2017 that it is something that requires uh, ongoing uh, evaluation. So I don't know that it needs to be a significant part of the sunset review, but it is something that we should uh, approach in terms of what our process of evaluation is uh, in terms of evaluating uh, our implicit bias training and to see if we can set up some parameters by which we can uh, judge the effect of. But I don't know if that needs to be, uh, you know, a significant component of sunset review. Uh, could we add that perhaps to uh, the, the section um, on the issue um, and add it as um, additional information that you recommended, as opposed to making it um, a new recommendation. Because I'm not, I'm not sure I'm clear about what a new recommendation would be spent on something that's already in process. Agree. Okay. Um, Mr. Persiska um, and team, is that possible to uh, provide an additional um, follow up in that area that we will uh, continue to monitor progress um, with consistent uh, reporting uh, at future board meetings? No, I think that that absolutely will be the right approach. I mean, okay. the legislature would always be looking for us to have in place systems of continuous improvement across the whole range of our activity. And particularly once where we've had identified problems in the past, that's something which we should prioritize. Great. Perfect. Uh, Ms. Pines. Yes, Dr. Hawkins. Oh, no, it's Dick. Dick oh sorry. Ford. I'm sorry, Doctor. That's right. I'm, I'm, I didn't see the visual. I, I developed the huskiness of yes, Dr. Hawkins' exactly. voice. Um, sorry about that. Um, so I, I just had a question. Um, this is under the under in Section 12 under the uh, designation of new issues under num item number six non-adversarial enforcement, but it, it really is um, an area that I think is something that we have lost when we're talking about the physician health and wellness program. And I know that, um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just asking the question uh, because so much of our, I mean, we have a population of, of uh, professionals that um, are not being optimally um, served, and, and, and as a result, the public is not being served. I mean, I think it's not just, not just. I don't just mean to say it's the, about the professional people. It's that they're then impaired to be able to serve the public um, when we don't have a physician wellness program that's active. And I, I, my my concern is that that seems like it's kind of buried in the report. It's not really a very high 
I mean, it isn't highlighted anywhere. It's kind of a subset of a subset. Um, I just am concerned that that's not going to get adequate attention when we get back to actually presenting this to the legislature because I think that is what that specifically was a big item of contention a number of years ago and when it was removed and and uh, deregulated or, or dis dismantled and now we're at a point where we really need that it's one of the tools we we need and we don't have um, I would like to see that prioritized in a way in some way as well uh, can I come in here at that point? Yes. Okay, well, first of all, I agree 1,000% with Dr. Thorpe's view that the wellness program is absolutely essential. And it's absolutely something which is an important part of our program going forward. The one thing which is slightly different here is that the enabling legislation has already been passed. Uh, we've, we have regulations which are currently before the DCA. So this is not something that we're asking the legislature to do anything. But clearly, I put it in this section because I wanted to highlight the fact that we were going to prioritize these aspects of non-adversarial enforcement and, and, and non-adversarial manners of dealing with doctors. I came from a jurisdiction in which we had a very active uh, health and wellness program that was absolutely vital. And the key to its success is that it did not proceed upon a formula, a formula, uh, a formalized procedural punitive route. And that's the key to its success. So yes, we have to highlight it, but again, we're not asking the legislatures to do anything. They've already done it. And it's just up to us to prioritize the implementation. And that's what we're doing. Uh, Ms. Pines, uh, Dr. Ganade, so Bill is absolutely correct. It's in our lab. And then we put it in BCA lab. So we have to take care of that. It has nothing to do with the legislature. They already passed. It is signed into the law. Ms. Pines? Yes. Uh, um, I just want to uh, clarify where we're at with the process. The, the first round did go to DCA. Um, as you may recall, there were then uh, proposed changes made to the uniform standards, mm -hmm. and those have not been finalized by DCA, but the board took the language back, um, made some changes so that it would not we wouldn't have to go through another rulemaking process every time the uniform standards were changed. And um, uh, the necessary documents have been uh, rewritten and the uh, finalization of the um, financial impact to this is being worked on. And then it will be going back to DCA again to, to go through that review process. Okay, great. Thank you for that update and clarity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have any final comments, um, suggestions, recommendations, changes before I move to the public? Okay. All right. So now I'm going to ask, we have a motion, we have a second, and now I'm going to ask for the host to call for public comments. Okay, and I went ahead and opened the Q&A window a little prematurely, so we've got several queued up here already. Oh, okay. First up, first up is from Hannah Ree. Hannah Ree, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is Hannah Ree of Black Patients Matter. Um, I just want to make a comment about um, the enforcement, um, so certainly, and also the bias training. So it's interesting we're spending so much time with implicit bias training uh, because, in fact, as you know, it, it doesn't work. But it's nice that you know we are discussing it to make it seem like it's something that works. And so, with you know, two of my federal civil rights lawsuits still ongoing, one of them going on for four years now. Um, I can tell you that 
you know, there's no one else that's going to be able to provide information back to you that there is corruption. So what happened is in the appeal process of my hearing, when I requested the transcripts to the hearing, in fact, they were altered. They were altered and they were not signed by the court reporter. And so even though they were not signed and altered, it was still accepted by the judge. So the reason why I share this with you is because um, to um, prevent the non-adversarial um, enforcement sort of thing, you're absolutely right. It's a big uphill battle because there's a lot of steps involved um, that, that just has to do with old fashioned corruption where you have a system that um, just is nothing less than hatred of the licensed physician. So as it stands now, um, in fact, enforcement is targeting members of EMOS, the Ethnic Medical Organization subsection of the CMA. I was the first, I'm revoked. Now there's a colleague who is an officer within the EMOS who is now targeted. So. It's great we're having all this talk, but in fact, it's pointless. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Yvonne Chung. Uh, Yvonne, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Yvonne Chung with the California Medical Association. Um, we've reviewed the new proposals included in the Sunset Review Report and of these proposals, uh, we're generally supportive of bringing um, investigators back under the control of the medical board if there's a way to do so in a manner that reduces costs and increases efficiency. In addition, we appreciate the focus on the non-adversarial strategies such as education letters and moving forward with the physician health program. The, pro the proposals that we have significant concerns about and do not believe should be included in the sunset review um, report include item number four, uh, statute of limitations tolling for subpoena enforcement. The NBC's proposed amendments would toll the statute of limitations upon service of an order to show cause prior to any judicial determination that the subpoena was issued in accordance with the law. And we believe this effectively penalizes licensees for exercising their rights and the privacy rights of their patients not to divulge constitutionally protected information. Um, Basically, we believe that uh, while we recognize the problem the medical board is trying to address with this, we believe this is an overly broad solution to an issue that the medical that the report actually states impacts very few cases. And in this time of COVID, um, it, physicians would be particularly affected because a court with a busy docket might just not be able to set a show cause hearing and the physician would then be penalized through no fault of their own. We also have concerns about item number five, the enhancement of authorized inspection powers, which we believe significantly expands the board's authority to conduct inspections and review medical records. Um, we believe these amendments likely constitute HIPAA violations and um, in, is in conflict with California's Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, CMIA. Um, generally, with some exceptions identified in the privacy rule, when using or disclosing protected health information, a physician has to make reasonable efforts to limit use or disclosure of PHI to the minimum necessary to accomplish the intended purpose of the use. And um, we believe that uh, this is this uh, the two amendments that are proposed here um, are overly broad, um, particularly um, the uh, allowance which would allow investigators to review records first to determine whether or not there is um, enough there that they could then request a subpoena to see the records, which totally um, violates the entire purpose of protecting the, the privacy rights of the patients. Um, in addition, the other two, I know I'm running out of time here, the other two areas that we had concerns about um, include cost recovery. Um, CMA continues to oppose cost recovery because we believe it limits the ability of licensees to exercise their due process seconds, rights. Right? And finally, the midwifery sunrise issue as well. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Ryan Spencer. I see you connected a couple of times here, Ryan, so I'm going to try this one first. Ryan, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead. Great. Um, Ryan Spencer, on behalf of... Sorry, I'm still here.
Okay, we lost that one. Let me try the other one. Ryan, are you still there? Okay. I'm right. Right. I apologize for that. We'll reset your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ryan Spencer, on behalf of the American College of OBGYNs, District 9, ACOG. ACOG has significant concerns with Section 12, Issue Number 8, the Midwifery Sunrise, and would oppose their move from the medical board unless there are significant changes in statute. As the statute reads now, the scope of practice of licensed midwives and what pregnancies they may or may not attend is both vague and insufficient. Given this vagueness, our only assurance that consumers were protected is that LMs were regulated by the medical board. If this oversight is removed, we are concerned that the lack of clarity in their scope could be interpreted to allow LMs to attend to births that are not low risk and to provide care outside their education and training, potentially endangering the safety of both the mother and the baby. Over the past year, we worked diligently with the Certified Nurse Midwives, or CNMs, on a bill, SB 1237-DOD, which would grant CNMs the ability to practice independently when appropriate and when to consult, collaborate with the physician when necessary. As you know, CNMs are not licensed midwives. They are, uh, CNMs are both nurses and midwives who work with physicians and have a higher level of education and training than LMs. In negotiations of SB 1237, we spent countless hours working with the CNMs to carefully draft language that ensure whatever births they attend on their own, particularly out of hospital, is both appropriate and has all the necessary safety precautions in place, including when to collaborate with a physician. We also maintained a level of physician involvement by ensuring there was a physician present on the committee, which is especially important when dealing with standard of care issues. At a minimum, ACOG believes these same safety precautions, including what would qualify as a low risk birth, should apply to LMs. Ultimately, if the board does decide to grant them their own licensing board, we would at the very least ask that, the, that elements of the recently passed SB 1237 serve as a guide when determining the appropriate scope of practice, notably what births they may attend, and the appropriate oversight, such as the makeup of the new board. We also want to take a close look at their education qualifications and ensure that there's at least some minimum standards that must be fulfilled before practice. We hope you find these requests reasonable, as we know you did support SB 1237, and welcome any involvement in discussion in the months moving forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Let me open your line. Michelle, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, I'm Michelle Montserrat Ramos, and I'm with Consumer Watchdog. Communication with the board, and especially board staff, with patients and families is beyond dismal. You are not building relationships with your patient stakeholders. We have worked with stakeholders in Kern County to educate patients and their families of the workings of the board. In the process, we have had two state senators communicate with the board on behalf of their constituents. Both state senators were incredibly dissatisfied with the communications with you. One state senator was told that if she wanted information to go to the website. The other state senator's staff spoke with one of your lead staff members who could not answer the most basic of questions. They now know how their constituents are treated badly. You have a probation monitor who has stated it is not her job to follow probation violations of a Kern County physician on probation. If the probation monitor does not monitor the physician on probation, then who does? While staff passes the buck from one staff member to the other, young mothers and babies are continuing to be harmed in Kern County. This disciplinary action was one of those easy wins. Now you are not monitoring his probation violations. Unacceptable. You are about to enter a sunset evaluation. What are you going to do about this? You now have thousands of engaged stakeholders. We will continue to work with other stakeholders, public stakeholders, to engage in your lack of action to protect consumers. Telling us that consumer protection is paramount is no longer acceptable. You will need to take real action to show your patient and family stakeholders that consumer protection is paramount. On an important note, Make sure that uniform standards for substance abusing healthcare professionals are the key component of any physician health program. The uniform standards are saving lives 
including physician lives. Your priority is consumer protection, not protecting substance abusing physicians. I know this personally. I have a dead husband to be thanks to a drug addicted surgeon. My advocacy is one of the reasons why there are uniform standards today, which are protecting the public. Mr. Hawkins, in response to you, the reason why I push to have the teleconference line opened up here for the board was for, for public protection, public participation for the public. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have uh, Rosie Arthur's daughter. Let me open your line again. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, there's three items I want to comment on. The first one will be brief because it's going to come up tomorrow. And I agree with the earlier commenters on the overreach that is occurring in the data sharing with the CDPH. And quite frankly, like they said, you're barking up the wrong tree. There's plenty of information to be had that doesn't compromise the identity of patients, et cetera to work on now. No, so data sharing can be a good thing though. In the early 90s, I worked with uh, then State Senator Liz Figueroa regarding the inequities that uh, went out with the rollout of the mandated reporting of disciplinary actions and lawsuit settlements uh, pursuant to the insurance code. <laughs> Strange way, but that's how it is. And as a result of that, we now have the license verification that's done online. With your sunset of the diversion program and the physician's wellness programs, what has happened is data sharing is still going on between your board and reciprocal boards. And some of that is available to the public from the other boards. But here in this state, unless that person is only in this state, uh, it has given people who go into the program without a good faith effort. You know, they've been forced to volunteer for the program because of a settlement or probationary uh, requirement. And they may relapse and relapse and relapse and relapse. And what happens is the other states pick it up and nothing is available here. When somebody does their due diligence, they can't find it by going to California. And then we get very uh, bad behaviors happening in some cases, not all cases, but in some. And we have people insinuating themselves into utilization review programs, independent review programs, and this type of a thing where nobody has any choice in the matter and some very bad decisions can be made threats have been made against patients and you know they start talking nonsense and you go oh red flag you check and boom you find out that there's a a problem so they should not be working when they're too close to the issue that they are making decisions on so i think there's a lot of work to be done on that and to remember even though that program has sunsetted the effect is still ongoing and then with the implicit bias, this is a point I brought up in January, uh, 2015. Patients are in the record as having things to watch out for because of the bias of the person writing the program. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Eric Andrews. Eric, let me open your line. Eric, are you there? Mm -hmm. I'm here. Please go ahead. Okay, I got to talk really fast because I have so much and I want to address Randy's question to the public. I hope you don't cut me off. Come on, folks. Did Trump write this report? It's a joke. I sent Bill an email about this already, which he did not respond to. TJ, you're awesome and spot on on your comments. Thank you. You and all the other board members should read our report from the last Sunset Review that we titled The Medical Farce of California. It's still available online and we still get good comments on it from the public. If this is the kind of malarkey you're going to present the legislature, we have no choice but to write our own report again addressing all of this information. This is mostly 369 pages of propaganda. 
It's not realistic. Are you all not concerned about the phoniness of how this is all presented in light of the hatred that the public has for this board? First of all, it shouldn't take a sunset review for you all to work toward change. You shouldn't still be learning a lot at this point. This board has been in existence for over a hundred years, for Christ's sake. As to Randy's question, I would be in favor of less regional meetings as long as you all don't take us less seriously because we're not there in person and we're allowed to show visuals for our presentations. I can see some of you tuning out when the public calls in. Save some money and have all the meetings in Sacramento, which we can attend or call into. For instance, on page 15, you talk about the death certificate project, but you make no mention about the flack you got from the CMA and how and many doctors over it, and how you then had to rethink what years you were going to focus on. On the same page, you talk about the interest studies meeting, but you don't mention that, that originally Kimberly Kirkmeyer tried to prevent certain advocate groups and the press from attending, which was in violation of the law that the meeting was scheduled for Los Angeles and then belligerently switched to Northern California, even though a majority of the advocates resided in Southern California, or how half of the meeting was wasted with an NBC presentation of redundant information, taking up precious time that you could have been listening to the attendees who made the time to be there to help this board. It doesn't mention that most of the board members couldn't even be bothered to stay for the meeting, showing how little respect they have for us all. It doesn't mention how Carrie Webb gave erroneous information to one upset victim of medical malpractice by telling her that this board has nothing to do with MICRA. This board only exists because of the MICRA deal. In order for MICRA to pass, it was promised that this board would protect patients from bad doctors, and yet your disciplinary rate stands at a steady rate of about 4%. That's not patient protection, and the legislature needs to know that, and by gosh, you know I'm going to tell them. And oh my gosh, you're bragging about that awful podcast that Carlos does? Talk about propaganda. Once again, you paint a glowing picture of this board as though nothing is wrong. Why then do you think the legislature would help make the board better? Why do you think that nothing ever really changes for the board better with this board? Because you're always lying and sugarcoating all the bad stuff that goes on. That has to stop. And we're, going to, and we're going to make sure that the legislature has all the proper information it needs to make a decision this time. Remember, every sunset review has, has people come to the board calling the board to be dissolved for the legislatures. This time will be no different. Your fabrications and propaganda need to be exposed. You know what's absolutely essential? A health and wellness program for consumers that you abuse when you don't do right by their complaints. Do you hear? Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Maria Orillo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Let me open your line, Maria, just one second. Yes. Maria, are you there? Yes, yes, that's me. Thank you so much. I've been waiting about uh, two and a half hours just to have a little comment. Um, I have been involved. I'm a licensed midwife, and I'm talking. I'm calling in comment about the um, the proposed midwifery board. My license is number four because I was involved in the creation of the um, Licensed Midwifery Act of California. So I've seen the evolution of our um, profession here in California. And I can only say that our um, professionalization has been increasing and evolving over time. And now it is desired, appropriate, and necessary for us to have our own unique board. I've also reviewed cases, so I'm familiar with that. But I've also seen the difficulties in communication um, that have to do with being under a, a, a medical board that actually doesn't even have a, a midwife who truly sits on that board. We don't have any true representation on a board that is regulating us. Um, the commenter from the uh, uh, California, you know, obstetrics and gynecology um, group has said that our licensure is vague. It is not. And actually, Section 2507 of the Business and Profession Code was updated in 2015 to very specifically spell out exactly who we can attend and who we can't attend. And, and we are not a kind of a loose, vague um, profession out here. I do understand that the acupuncturists have now have their own acupuncture board. board and I believe it's time that we have our own midwifery board. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, I have Jeannie Cho. Uh, Jeannie, let me open your line. Hear me? <clears throat> Jeannie, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, hi. 
My name is Jeannie Che, and I'm commenting in support of a licensed midwifery board. Um, I have twice received midwifery care in California. I'm also a California licensed midwife working exclusively with a low risk population. I support a licensed midwife board and I truly appreciate the board's support in approving a licensed midwife board under the sunset review legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Nicole Reganelli. Uh, Nicole, let me open your line. Second. Nicole, are you there? I am, Sean. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Nicole Reganelli, and I'm I'm one of those consumers. <laughs> I received midwifery care from licensed midwives here in California for my pregnancies. And I just wanted to say thank you to this board for supporting an independent midwifery board um, and all your consideration. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Bridget Barnato. Bridget, give me a moment to open your line. Bridget, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, um, I, my name is Bridget Barnato from Marin County, California. Um, I'm a student midwife and I support an independent midwifery board. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, I have Michelle Wellborn. Michelle, let me open your line. Uh, Michelle, are you there? I'm here. My name is Michelle Wellborn. My name is Michelle Wellborn. I'm a licensed midwife here in California and I support an independent midwifery board. Okay, thank you for your comment. I have Mason Cornelius yet. Mason, let me open your line just a second. Well, it looks like we have lost Mason. I will take another look at that name. Uh, next up, I have Tanya McCracken. Tanya, let me find you. Okay, again, Tanya, I got two of you here, so I'm going to try this one first. Tanya, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Could you mute your other device so it, it doesn't create the feedback? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. My name is Tanya McCracken. I'm a licensed midwife. I'm also a consumer of midwifery care, and I just wanted to say that I support the board in creating an independent midwifery board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, Jen Campbell. Jen, Jen, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Excellent. Good afternoon. I'm Jen Camel, founder and CEO of VBAC Facts and president of the Californians for the Advancement of Midwifery. Today, I represent thousands of birthing families throughout California when I express my support for a licensed midwife board in California. The expectation that midwives, a female dominated profession that has long been marginalized and historically suppressed by male dominated professions, should be regulated by physicians, a male dominated profession, is paternalistic. Given the looming insolvency of the board and the high cost of physician regulation, it is important for licensed midwives to have financial autonomy as a profession when it comes to managing their licensure program. Additionally, licensed midwives are trained healthcare providers who have shown their ability to practice autonomously since the passing of AB 1308. Now is the time for midwives to regulate themselves. If you're curious about the state of licensed midwifery in California, please look to Claudia Bregulia's presentation on licensed midwives from the last medical board meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Joan Green. Joan, are you there? I'm here. Please. Uh, yes, my name is Joan Green. I'm a licensed midwife in California and have been a midwife for more than 35 years. I want to speak in favor of us having an independent midwifery board. I think that we are well trained in autonomous midwifery and that we would do well to regulate ourselves. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Rosanna Davis. Rosanna, give me a minute to open your line. 
Rosanna, are you there? Yes, hello, good afternoon. Uh, I am Rosanna Davis, president of California Association of Licensed Midwives, also known as CALM, C-A-L-M. First, I wanna thank the medical board staff for the thorough and accurate information and history about the licensed midwife program included in the Sunset Report. And secondly, I wanna point out that forming a licensed midwife board is not a scope issue, as was the nurse midwife bill earlier this year. Nurse midwives already have their own board, the Board of Registered Nurses. Licensed midwifery is neither the practice of nursing or medicine. The licensed midwife scope and education is clearly defined and um, licensed midwives have excellent outcomes. So thank you for considering the proposal to sunrise the licensed midwife program under the medical board sunset review process. Since the previous medical board sunset review, CALM has been laying groundwork for this sun rising with legislators, business and profession um, committee staff. CALM feels very strongly that a licensed midwife board will be the best solution for the AB 1308 regulatory stalemate for appropriate consumer protections and fiscally sound management of the licensed midwife program. CALM represents membership consisting of 200 plus licensed midwives and 50, and 50 or more student midwives. CALM members and the larger midwife community are in support of the proposed proposal for a licensed midwife board. I'd like to finish by quoting the Sunset Review Report because it summarizes the issue well. Quote, given the physician's supervision has been removed from licensed midwives, the board does not believe that they should be licensed and regulated by a medical board and are supportive of the licensed midwives establishing their own board. Calm is very much in favor of um, your keeping with uh, with that sentiment in the uh, sunrise process for licensed midwives. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Teresa Yu. Uh, Teresa, let me open your line. Teresa, are you there? Yes. Hello. Thank Please. you. Good afternoon. I'm Teresa Yu, the board president of California Families for Access to Midwives. And I'm also a consumer of licensed midwifery care myself. CFAM is a consumer advocacy organization that has over 5,000 supporters, and we focus upon increasing midwifery access and birth options for California families. We are in very strong support of a licensed midwifery board. There are many reasons why consumers choose to birth with licensed midwives. Just to note, as you all know, licensed midwives are a distinct profession from nurse midwives, and they specialize in out-of-hospital maternity care. It is a very intentional and thought out decision that one makes when they choose a licensed midwife, one that sometimes involves great effort, traveling um, great distances and people being willing to cover costs out of pocket. And one of the most significant reasons is for wanting a midwifery model of care. We don't think it makes sense for independently practicing midwives to be overseen by a medical board, the medical board. And we don't believe this is a structure that exists for any other profession to be overseen like this by another profession. We believe that licensed midwifery board oversight would lead to improving the quality of care um, for consumers and the experience of care for consumers. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Madeline Weisner. Madeline, give me a moment to open your line. Madeline, are you there? Hi, I'm here. I'm Madeline Weissner. I'm a licensed midwife. I'm also a midwifery client and a Medi-Cal provider. I just wanted to thank the board for supporting a licensed midwife board under the Sunset Review legislation. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, I have Sarah Davis. Sarah, give me a moment to open your line. Sarah, are you there? Yes, I am. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Davis. I'm a licensed midwife in San Diego. I'm calling to thank this board so much for your work on the midwifery program over the years since 1993. And thank you for your uh, proposal for sunrising a midwifery board. Um, I do support a midwifery board myself as a licensed midwife and also as a consumer of services of licensed midwives, of nurse midwifery services, and of OBGYN services. Um, and so thank you very much. 
Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Marianne Hollingsworth. Marianne, let me open your line. Marianne, are you there? I am. Please go ahead. Okay. All right. Hello, this is Marianne Hollingsworth. A big thank you to Mr. Watkins for bringing up the issue of empathy with this board, especially when it comes to reprimands. One doctor in my complaint was given a PLR after she drugged her father without consent with antipsychotics and sedatives, falsified drug consent forms, and even falsified a do not resuscitate order. My father died and she just got a PLR. The other doctor in my complaint uh, for my father's care was just given a letter, the kind the CMA likes, encourage him to meet higher standards. I warned you about the second daughter when I appealed your decision, your decision not to take action, telling you that other patients could be harmed if you failed to act. That second doctor ended up on your death certificate project after he gave an addicted patient 480 Vicodin pills in a six week period and that man overdosed. When things like this happen, it's obvious that the board is not listening to patients or the loved ones of patients who died. We look to you for accountability and so often we are ignored and dismissed. It's like our loss is not as important as protecting the doctor's reputation and practice. The public needs to know you're listening to us and that you will act quickly to protect us when you encounter a complaint regarding a dangerous doctor. We need your empathy. Please add this intent to your Sunset Review report. The last review, at the last review, Dr. Gananadev and Kim Kirchmeyer were not asked about enforcement stats or the cases that were tossed. Most of the discussion was on the lack of probation transparency, and shortly after that, SB 1448, the patient's right to know bill, was, uh, was passed. Nothing was said about improving enforcement at the last Sunset Review. As Mr. Watkins said, you are not doing great. You need to improve to do better. And more importantly, you need to listen to the public, to the harmed patients. And you need to state your willingness to change to truly protect the public. If you don't do this, you will just be lying to the state legislature about your progress when you represent your sunset review, just to get four more years. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have uh, Kate Vanderree, let me open your line, Kate. Kate, are you there? I am, thank you. My name is Kate Vanderree, and I am a student midwife, and I would like to add my support to an independent midwifery advisory board. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have uh, Julia McMillan. Julia, are you there? Um, yes, I am here. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I, my name is Julia McMillan. I am a licensed midwife. I am also a consumer of midwifery care. I had two licensed midwives at each of my two lovely home births, and I support the board in, um, in your decision to um, have a licensed midwife board. Thank you very much. Thank you for your public comment. Um, we'll have uh, Morgan West. Morgan, let me open your line. Morgan, are you there? Yes, I am. I am also calling in as a licensed midwife and consumer of midwifery care in support of an independent midwifery board. Thanks for having us. Okay, sorry, I've got lots of duplicate replies here. I believe that is uh, everyone that's asked for public comment on this item. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. One, one more. I'm one coming here. Uh, uh, Britt Eldridge. Uh, Britt, give me just a moment to open your line. Britt, are you there? I am here. Yeah, thank you. Please go ahead. <laughs> um, I also am calling in as a licensed midwife. Um, thank you. Uh, appreciate your consideration for an independent board. Um, and just echo what was said before that it is true that we are not represented by our own through this board and fully support an independent midwifery board. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, and I'm going to just double check that that Mason has not returned. 
Unfortunately, I think we lost that image also. I believe that's all, Ms. Pines. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Cabo, please perform the roll call for the motion and the second on the sunset review report. Ms. Campoverdi. Aye. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krauss. Aye. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Dr. Thorpe. I'm sorry, Dr. Thorpe. Dr. Thorpe, are you there? Dr. Toronto. Yes. Mr. Watkins. Dr. Yip. Aye. Ms. Pines. Yes. Great. Members, please mute your computers. We have approved the sunset review report. Um, and we've authorized staff to do um, some tweaking um, and they will finalize this report. We will now move on to. Pines, yep. Forgive me. Um, is Dr. Thorpe there? Can he respond to the roll call? Okay. We, we're not able to hear Dr. Thorpe right now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, we're going to move to uh, agenda item eight an update from the attorney general's office. Ms. Castro. Yes, uh, good evening. First off, we would like to welcome the new board members, Dr. Tirado and Ms. Campo Verde. The health quality enforcement section looks forward to meeting you and working with you in executing your important mission of public protection. Since the last medical board meeting, the health quality enforcement section has had several meetings with board staff. First off, HQE management met with Mr. Prasivka and Ms. Jones, and in attendance were also members of the Attorney General's executive sp staff, specifically my boss, Civil Division Chief Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Wolf, and Chris Ryan, our Chief of Operations, who oversees budget matters in our office. Our meeting allowed Mr. Prasivka to personally relay concerns about the board's budget issues, and I believe that the meeting was productive. We have also continued meeting with Ms. Jones on a micro level relating to casework, and also on a macro level on policy issues relating to management of handoff cases sent to the health quality enforcement section, and also finding cost effective solutions to managing the incoming work using technology to benefit us and find cost savings there. The health quality enforcement section has also met with the Department of Consumer Affairs new chief, um, Ms. Kirchmeyer, and health quality enforcement section together with the licensing section uh, discuss with them uh, issues concerning policy matters and other pending projects. I continue to meet with the Office of Administrative Hearings to manage the hearings and court calendar issues that the pandemic has brought, brought upon us. This means we continue to deal with the hardware and software challenges and the learning curve related to conducting live hearings in new platforms such as Case Lines, which is a trial presentation software, and with Microsoft Teams. We apply these two modalities to the trials in your cases. The health quality enforcement section has also overcome internal technology issues to achieve all of our goals. The HQE legal staff have met the challenge due to their passion for this work, achievement oriented posture and professional excellence. I'm extremely proud of the group I am privileged to lead. They have shown integrity, leadership and initiative in their professional work, all while balancing these tr very troubling times together with personal obligations to their families. And in conclusion, our annual Business and Professions Code Section 312.2 report is on schedule to be published on January 1st, 2021. And that concludes my remarks, Madam President. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Castro, for your update. Are there any uh, questions or comments from members? Okay. Um, I will now ask the host to call for public comments. Okay, I've opened up the Q&A window. If anyone would like to make a public comment, please indicate so. Okay, first up, we have Hannah Reed. Give me a moment just to open your line. Hannah Reed, are you there? Yes, hello, thank you. So, medical board, um, there's no other way to say this, and I'll present evidence to you. Um, so, two of my federal civil rights lawsuits, it's still ongoing. And uh, there'll be a couple more. So what we're facing is it's nothing less than just corruption at the AG office. Um, when I ordered hearing records from the um, office of administrative hearings, um, they gave me, I paid $3,000 for these um, transcripts at the hearing uh, office. And when they gave it to me, um, it was altered, not just, um, you know, some statements deleted, that kind of thing was altered. And it was all altered in favor of the um, AG office. So what you're not just paying for, but what you're overpaying for is a, a corrupt AG office. That's why it's so expensive, because you're paying a lot of money to this investigative unit that, for example, in my case, of the thousands of home visits i done across three states, the only time that I got my vehicle broken into was during the time that I was under investigation with this um, HQIU office. So that's what you're seeing. That's what you're facing. Um, I don't know that anything can be done about it. I think it's just part of being uh, a California um, investigative unit. There's so much corruption in California um, enforcement unit with the police. I think the first step is definitely defund the police, but it's an uphill battle because you're facing uh, an expensive, corrupt system. It is what it is. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, at this time, I don't see any other requests for public comment. So. Take it back, Mr. Banks. Okay, great. Um, moving on to agenda item nine, update from the Health Quality Investigation Unit, Mr. Chris and Ms. Nichols. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Chris, and I'm the Chief of the Department of Consumer Affairs Division of Investigation. I'll be providing an update on the division's Health Quality Investigation Unit. HQIU currently has four investigator vacancies, which is a 5% vacancy rate. And there are six candidates currently in the background process uh, to fill these positions. The first graph displayed shows the amount of cases that HQIU has completed versus received for the past fiscal year. As you can see, HQIU is very productive and completed significantly more cases each month for the, past, for the last six months of the past fiscal year than we received. The next graph shows HQIU's uh, uh, progress with case completions since the last board meeting. For the months of July, August, and September, HQIU investigators have completed more than double the investigations than we have received. This continued progress will reduce overall timelines and help reduce the pending workload for investigators. Our new expert procurement unit is fully operational and is receiving referrals from all 12 field offices. This new unit will make the expert process more efficient and give the sworn investigators more time to devote to investigative tasks, which will reduce case completion times overall. Also, we are developing a new training to provide for all sworn staff regarding investigating impairment cases. We are in the process of getting approved through the Commission on Peace Officer 
standards and training uh, and expect to provide the training uh, later this year or early in the new year. Additionally, we are continuing to meet monthly with board staff to discuss cases and continue our efforts at improving timelines and further streamlining our combined processes. That concludes our update for today, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Do any members have any comments or questions for Mr. Chris's report? Dr. Hawkins. Okay. I don't remember the exact number, but it seems like it's the same number or close to the same number of investigators that were in training as the last uh, quarterly board meeting. Has there been any change in the number of investigators you hired or completed a tr completed training? Um, yes, so the, 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 it's, the number's a, a snapshot in time. And so uh, we get uh, new members come in and then sometimes, you know, it's a very large uh, organization. So some members uh, uh, retire or are promoted. And so the number that we provide is the actual number um, at the time of this uh, meeting. So, so they're, they're different individuals. Okay. Any Yes, uh, Mr. Chris, you mentioned a new unit called the expert something unit that's up and running. What is that? Um, is it the expert procurement unit? And uh, I think I'll I'll shift to uh, our deputy chief Kathleen Nichols uh, to give you a little bit of information about that unit. Okay. Hi, um, Kathleen here. Yes, the new expert procurement unit will actually be helping to assist select the experts on the cases, package the cases for expert, and also send the cases out and track the opinions when they come back in. So a lot of the other boards at DCA, the boards themselves handle this process. It's not handled by investigative staff. And we thought this would be a good idea to utilize some of our positions to create this unit because it's a, a more effective way to complete the process without tying up the sworn staff doing the same thing. Okay, so this group is supposed to take away and free up the sworn staff allow them to do more of their investigations, right? Yes, and then it would allow analysts to then do the more analytical work of, you know, matching up the experts and packaging the cases, getting them out, getting the opinions back, and kind of the administrative back end part of the process. Okay, thank you. It's Dr. Mahmoud. Yes. Um, Investigators. How have you been able to double the number of cases already done and the number is going fast so fast? What is the typical thing you have done now in the last two, three quarters, which has not been done in so many years? It, you know, as we're finally bringing our uh, uh, staffing up to adequate levels and it's, it's, it's a lot of that staff is uh, getting better at the work that they do. It takes uh, time for people to learn how to do the work and uh, get really good at doing it. Um, and we've also been able to, um, uh, you know, utilize some savings uh, regarding travel and things like that regarding uh, teleworking and whatnot. So uh, we're, we're learning as we go and uh, we're really um, happy with the amount of work that's, uh, uh, you know, that our people are being productive and um, they're, uh, continuing to to stay, there's been wage increases, and so the turnover uh, has uh, lessened, and that um, uh, you know overall staff is being more productive. So, just my follow up question on that is obviously you said that wages are being increased. Are you doing everything possible to retain these people who are getting really expert and doing this really fast process? So, the most important thing will be to retain that kind of staff so that we can basically satisfy public much better way in coming I, years. I, can, I completely agree. And uh, we're, we're doing, um, you know, more very specific training, uh, you know, for their needs. And we're, um, you know, the, the wages are a, uh, a bargaining uh, issue uh, with the union, so we can't really 
uh, comment on that or or get in, get into that. But there has been um, uh, continual uh, uh, wage wage adjustments uh, that have happened recently for the investigators. And I know uh, I've I've mentioned that uh, at many board meetings in the past, and the board has been very supportive. And I thank you so much for your support in this area. It goes a long way uh, to helping uh, keep. Uh, staff and we we have a really good team and i'm just uh, exceedingly proud uh of all of our staff they've done a really great job uh overall and and especially with the uh, you know all the difficulties because of uh you know the pandemic they've uh really you know hung in there and they're you know they're they're producing and so uh you know things are going well and i'm and i'm just happy to report that thank you great um thanks dr thorpe Yes, please. Um, so it does, I, I applaud Mr. Chris. Applaud your uh, your success at retention and in, in in the training of staff. And clearly, you are in the last few months. You've significantly increased the cases that are completed. But there's another phenomenon that's interesting, and that is that the cases that have been referred are dramatically lower. Um, you know, it, it it appears in July, September, and October. The cases referred were 150 to 170, and in the last three months, really four months, um, cases have been below, well, one month in April was 113, but every other month has been below 100 in, case, in terms of cases reported. So it does, I don't know if that's because of COVID, I don't know what the problem is, or what the issue is there, but there's a second issue going on, and that is that there are less cases reported than and you're also, I mean, you're obviously completing cases, but there are a fewer number of cases reported as well. Um, do you have an explanation for that? You know, uh, I, I think, um, uh, you know, the board executive officer talked about that they were closely examining, you know, cases that were uploaded at the front end. And so, um, you know, that 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 could be part of it. I'm, I, I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, we're not we're not in control of what gets, uh, you know, referred to us, but um you know we are are you know very happy with with uh, the production and i think if we continue this trend that that uh you know any backlogs uh you, you know just continue to get you know reduced and we continue to report you know, good news at these meetings i'm i'm um, i'm very pleased by that okay thank you what's what's our backlog right now Kathleen, do you have that? Uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily call it a backlog. I'd refer to it as our pending workload. Our pending workload is hovering around 1,900 investigations right now. Okay, thank you. So that's what we're working on. But all the cases are assigned, so there's no there's no backlog. It's ju it's just a high volume of work that we're dealing with right now. And hopefully, as we continue to complete double of what we're getting in, we'll see that pending workload reduce. Okay. Thank you. Are there any additional comments from the members? Okay, if none, um, Sean, let's go to the public for comments. Okay, I've opened up the Q&A line. If uh, you'd like to make a public comment, please go ahead and indicate in there that you have. Uh, first up, we have Hannah Ree. Hannah, let me find your line. Hannah Ree, are you there? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So Hannah Ree of Black Patients Matter. Um, look, so bravo to Mr. Chris. Unfortunately, um, he's uh, feeding you a line. He's politely telling you that um, he's not doing much work for a, a pay raise that he's gotten. So in fact, only the one only reason that it takes him such a long time to um, wrap up a case is that they're trying to fit a circle into a square hole. And so in my case, of course, what happened is they got a non-board certified um, expert, and then they've got another expert who's a hired gun, who only works for the uh, medical board, and that took time to find them, and that sort of thing. So that's what we're really paying for. It's a very, very expensive process to um, force a, a physician to lose his license based on uh, being, a, being a whistleblower. 
and standing up for um, patient care. So that's um, that's still making its way through the courts. And as far as this new expert procurement unit, hopefully that won't add to the backlog of cases. We have to call it it call it what it is. Um, it's taking them a long time to close these cases because um, I guess it's just how they they rack up their money. Um, just uh, hurry up and wait, I suppose. So as far as getting things packaged up nicely for the expert, um, again, you know the the whole process. Once you look at it from um, end to end, you'll see that it's very biased. And what they're doing is that um, they will select um, experts who um, only um, uh, represent the medical board in cases. And then it, it's just, it's shocking to me that the AG's office would go to such lengths as to somehow alter um, the transcripts from a hearing. How How is that done? Who does that? So much so again that um, the court reporter did not even sign the documents. And in any event, um, I just want to emphasize again that the AG's office is part of the problem with the high morbidity mortality rate of African American physicians. It's because they're utilizing medical experts who have never seen a black patient and some of them by choice. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I don't see any other requests in queue. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chris and Ms. Nichols. Our next agenda item is 10, an update from the Department of Consumer Affairs, Ms. Holmes. Ms. Holmes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good afternoon, Board President Pines and board members. I'm Carrie Holmes, Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Relations at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Thank you for inviting me to provide a department update to the Medical Board. I would like to welcome Alejandra Campo Verde as the newest member of the Medical Board. Congratulations on your appointment and thank you for your willingness to serve. I also want to recognize Board President Pines as this is her final meeting with the Medical Board. DCA appreciates your years of service and leadership as a public member. The work you have done on behalf of California's consumers is invaluable. DCA wishes you all the best. One of my top priorities here at Board and Bureau Relations is appointments, and I would like to provide a brief overview. According to the Medical Practice Act, the board consists of 15 members, eight physicians, and seven public members who serve four-year terms and may be reappointed. Currently, the board has two vacancies, one public member appointed by the Speaker of the Assembly and one by the Governor. With the departure of Board President Pines, the Medical Board will soon have a third public member vacancy. I want to assure you that DCA and all the appointing authorities share the goal of a fully seated, diverse, and effective board. Filling current and upcoming vacancies is a priority. Interested individuals can find the link titled Board Member Resources on DCA's homepage to apply for an appointment. Another top priority for DCA is efficient and effective investigations. As the medical board prepares for sunset and looks to the future, DCA is also taking a hard look at the investigation process, as you heard from Mr. Chris. HQIU staffing, training, and restructuring all share the goal of continuing to reduce case timelines and pending cases. We understand how important these timelines are and have made this a priority. To that end, the DCA executive leadership has decided to hire an individual who is very familiar with the investigative processes to work with the executive team and the team of the Division of Investigation to identify ways to increase efficiency, decrease investigative time frames, and improve the quality of investigations. This individual will be reviewing investigations, statistics, and recommendations from DCA's Organizational Improvement Office in order to assist in the investigation. The overall goal is to decrease the time frames of investigations while still maintaining the quality of investigation. DCA will provide updates to the board on the changes made, as well as the improvements as a result of this additional review. Our work continues, even though COVID-19 has changed the way we do business now and in the future. After a temporary closure in March due to state and local stay-at-home orders to prevent the spread of COVID-19, 
DCA offices remain open with preventative measures to safeguard the health and safety of our employees and visitors. DCA continues to partner with the Governor's Office and Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency on statewide efforts related to awareness and enforcement of public health measures. DCA would like to thank the board and staff for your continued service despite these challenges. As part of the state's ongoing efforts to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and in order to protect the health and safety of the public, California Department of Public Health determined that California needs more than 10,000 contact tracers to support existing state and local public health departments. The state is using employees from across state service to fulfill this role. All state departments were required to identify 5% of employees for redirection to contact tracing. I know your board has several staff working on this, and I want to thank you. This work is vital not only to keep people safe and healthy, but also to allow more of our economy and services to remain open. As soon as CDEPH releases any updates on the program, DCA will be sure to share them with you. Lastly, I would like to update you on some of the work Board and Bureau Relations is doing to support the Medical Board's new executive team, along with all Board and Bureau leaders. Board and Bureau Relations has put on three brown bag trainings this fall to provide executive officers the opportunity to learn and discuss best practices on topics such as appointments, managing staff remotely, and providing ADA compliant meeting materials to board members and the public. In partnership with DCA's Solid Training Unit, Board member orientation trainings have been held quarterly as, as remote sessions, and a new training for board presidents is in the planning stages. Additionally, Director Kirkmeyer and Chief Deputy Lally and I meet monthly with the Medical Board's executive team. We welcome any suggestions for future training topics or other ways we can support the board. I look forward to the day we can meet in person. In the meantime, if you have any questions or need anything from DCA, please don't hesitate to reach out. Board of Bureau Relations is here to help. Thank you again for inviting me to your meeting. I can the presentation and I will hand it back over to Board President Max. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. Are there any questions or comments from the members? I will ask the host to call for public comments. Okay, I've opened the Q and A box. If anyone has a public comment to make. Okay, first up we have Eric Andrews. Eric, are you there? I'm here. Please go ahead. Oh my gosh, Denise, I did not know this was your last meeting. That yeah. really does make me sad. As much as you may not believe that, I, I think you're a really cool person. And I think outside of the board, we would probably hang out and have a really good time. Um, I, you've certainly been the most sympathetic of the presidents since my tenure of being at these meetings more so than any other president that I've seen there. And I wanna thank you for that. Um, I know you tried your hardest to be there for us. And I know you've got a lot of obstacles and things you have to keep in mind when dealing with people like me. So I appreciate what you did do, I really do. Um, but continuing in that same vein, I hope this does not mean that Ron Lewis is moving up to take your place because that would be like Trump taking office and set us all backwards. Remember, he was the one that said, we can't hang everybody. He is one of the, the least sympathetic people on the board, and he is one of the least sympathetic to patient safety advocates and our plight to make this board better. And I don't know what he's been drinking during this meeting, but he's drinking it out of a wine glass, and I don't know, it's weird. So let's, I just hope that, no, I saw the wine glass earlier, and I'll put it on YouTube, Ron, if, if I can get this, the clip, because I'm recording this. Um, Please don't let him move up because he is not for patient safety. He is the antithesis of non-patient safety. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Hannah Ree. Hannah, are you there? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, so Hannah Ree here. Um, so Pines, I didn't realize this was your uh, last meeting. I wanna thank you for uh, your presence and uh, your leadership. And also, I wish you luck. Um, I understand you're a, a board member at Charles Drew. Um, I, I surely hope that we can um, have more medical experts um, working for the board who have um, treated a diversified patient population. 
Um, the problem again with the medical experts that are uh, being employed or paid for by the medical board is that most of them, most of them treat um, exclusively white patients, um, whether voluntarily or not. So hopefully um, we can continue to push for uh, medical experts in California to be um, ones who come from clinics that treat the diversified patient population. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, and this time I don't see any other requests in queue. Okay, great. Um, moving to the next item, which is item 11, discussion, discussion and possible action on legislation and regulations. Mr. Baum. Good evening, members. Uh, the first item in your legislative packet is the tracker list, which reflects the status of all the bills that the board took a position upon that were signed into law by the governor. As you can see here and on the tracker two chart at the end of this item, the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on the volume of legislation considered and approved and approved by the legislature. In fact, this year, the legislature approved less than half the number of bills than they did in 2019. With regard to the five bills highlighted in green on the tracker chart, I will provide a brief summary of those and review the implementation items that have been identified by staff thus far. As these bills have been signed into law, there is no action required necessarily by the board members on these items. With your permission, Madam President, I will pause after each bill for member questions or comments. First up is AB 890, which creates pathways for nurse practitioners to practice without the supervision of a physician and surgeon. The analysis before you lays out the requirements and particulars of that new authority. These nurse practitioners, as with other advanced practice nurses, will continue to be regulated by the Board of Registered Nursing. Earlier this week, the members and board staff received a letter from the California Medical Association requesting that the, board, the board's further involvement with the implementation of the bill, specifically that the board conduct a legal and policy analysis of AB 890 and its impact on physicians and consumers, monitor and be an active participant in the promulgation and adoption of regulations and guidance issued by the Board of Registered Nursing, and provide guidance and education to physicians regarding supervision requirements of nurses, physicians' legal responsibilities, and their duty of care when working with the new types of nurse practitioners established by AB 890. As this bill, excuse me, as this letter was received by the board and staff uh, just two days ago, staff wish to further review these requests, consult with the Board of Registered Nursing and others, and update the board at a future meeting with any additional recommended action items regarding the implementation of this bill. At this point, as indicated in the analysis and the meeting materials, staff plan to include up, uh, information in our newsletter and update any relevant content on the board's website as this new program comes online. With that, I will pause and be happy to take any questions or comments on this bill. Ms. Howard, um, regarding uh, this bill, uh, I think it would be great if we could work directly with the Board of Registered Nurses and really have the same information piece so that we don't end up publishing something in our newsletter about implementation that may be different from what the Board of Registered Nurses uh, will publish. Uh, and that uh, we don't necessarily need to wait for the next uh, board meeting. I would encourage the staff of the two boards to uh, work together and to begin to hammer out uh, our understanding of what the law requires because the law takes effect before our next meeting. Uh, and that uh, hopefully Perhaps you can invite the uh, representatives of the Board of Registered Nurses to be at our next meeting, uh, but prior to that, uh, come to some informational uh, pieces for physicians, for nurses, and for consumers uh, in terms of exactly what this, what this new law means and, and how it should be implemented and what we all need to know about it so that we can work together in behalf of uh, consumers. That's a good recommendation. The recommendation is to ask staff to work directly with the staff of the Board of Registered Nurses to develop uh, a uniform uh, informational piece to be uh, disseminated to physicians, nurses, and consumers. 
And I would also recommend that we have uh, a presentation or a collaboration uh, with the Board of Registered Nurses at our next board meeting. Okay. Are there any other members that would like to comment on AB 890 and its implementation? Uh, yeah, Dr. Ganadev. Dr. Ganadev, I, I would like to hear from uh, especially primary care docs up there and the board what their thoughts are and see how uh, Medical Board of California can work with, uh, with the nursing board to really come up with what's in the best interest of the consumer patient. Uh, not the doctors, not the nurses, but the consumers. I'm a vascular surgeon. I don't uh, deal a lot with the NPs, so. Um, doesn't sound like there's any additional comments uh, from Great. members. Uh, is there somebody Dr. else? Dr. Mahmood, is that you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I have had several calls from local area primary care doctors and internists um, who are kind of concerned about this thing. Many of them are concerned that they spend so much time, go to medical school and go to proper training and all this stuff, and they've established the practice. And now, right, all of a sudden, a nurse practitioner will come and open an office next to them and their business will be gone. Some people are really concerned about, are they really able to do independently practice to uh, deal with all the uh, complicated cases? and uh, what will be the supervision and all kind of stuff. So there are really a lot of concerns in the communities, especially in medical community. And obviously I have spoken to many um, people who are for the consumers and they are also concerned about that people will be kind of uh, uh, misinformed that, okay, they are equally trained just like doctors and they will be taking care of everything. And I think medical board should really come up with some kind of guidelines for this. Um, yeah, I think the recommendation that Dr. Krause has um, put on the table is probably our best way of getting to that. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Is there any other uh, member that wants to make a comment? Um, I apologize, Ms. Pines. I had a medical emergency. I had to take care of for a few minutes while I was off the phone. So um, I did not hear Dr. Krause's recommendation. Is it possible to have him restate that? Yes. Dr. Krause? Uh, Dick, it was to uh, authorize and request our staff to collaborate with the staff of the Board of Registered Nurses to uh, develop a uh, information piece to be disseminated to physicians, nurses, and consumers, uh, which would be uniform, uh, rather than to have the medical board send out its own interpretation of the law and the nurses uh, a different interpretation of the law so that we can collaborate uh, in informing the public and informing licensed practitioners. Uh, and, you know, there, there probably is some ambiguity in this law and to engage the uh, Board of Registered Nurses in, in understanding its implementation, I think is very important. Part of my recommendation was also to ask uh, representatives of the Board of Registered Nurses to uh, present at our next uh, board meeting uh, so that we could uh, have a board to board discussion. Um, yeah, I think that's an excellent first step um, because I think there are some areas of ambiguity in the law that are a little bit of a concern. Um, the law basically, I mean, clearly there's, you know, the truth is none of us are independent. We're, we're all, you know, we're, we all depend on each other um, in whether it's physician assistants, nurse practitioners, primary care docs, specialty. It's that we are a providing a, a resource for the community, so we're not truly independent in in any for for all of us. But for a nurse practitioner to be able to easily refer a case that's difficult or that is not going as they would like it to see, or that a patient actually requests to see a doctor rather than the nurse practitioner, those um, avenues, those paths, have not been clearly delineated about how that's going to work or how that's expected for a nurse practitioner to develop those paths or 
to have a collaborative relationship with a physician um, to be able to to manage those cases because it's you know what's true is that you don't know what you don't know and and there's lots of things that I don't know um, even after practicing for 40 years there's lots of stuff I still don't know um, and f- every day I'm faced with a problem that I don't quite know how to manage so I need to reach out to other colleagues to try and get the answers to some of those questions so there will be those issues with nurse practitioners whether they're still being supervised by a physician or whether they're they're uh, on our so-called independent um, they're going to still need to have some avenue of um, approach to be able to collaborate with their physician colleagues so i just think it's uh it, it that's that's a part of the law that is um quite um uh, unclear and um i I, clearly it's it's implied in the law because it says in the law that you know i'm sorry i had it all outlined here before before i left but um you know it says um under the following circumstances the physician consultation should be obtained um under emergent conditions requiring prompt medical intervention acute decompensation of patient situation, a problem which is not resolving as anticipated, and um, a history, physical, or lab findings inconsistent with the clinical perspective and on request of the patient. So those are, there's a broad variety of situations where physician referral is recommended, and that isn't clearly outlined about how it's going to happen. So I think the collaboration with the nursing board is an excellent idea. I would certainly support that. But I think we also need to probably have a working group um, of some sort developed that would be um, working with uh, working, uh, you know, some some representation from the medical board and from the from the board of nursing. That would be a working group that would help develop some of those um, guidelines about how to how to uh, deal with cases that are not that are not proceeding as you would expect. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think, are there any other member? Uh, Dr. Hall, quickly. Yes. Uh, so I've heard some of the same concerns that Dr. Mahmoud uh, had mentioned. And uh, Dr. Thorpes, I really like the additional input you just gave. One thing we recognize with on the Health Professional Education Foundation is that um, nurse practitioners, these, these advanced practice nurse practitioners are going to some of the underserved areas uh, providing care where there's been difficulty getting physicians to practice in these areas. Just a comment. Thank you. Um, any other comments uh, from uh, Madam, members? Just one one follow up to Dr. Hawkins <laughs> and I and I and I think there are clearly there are people who are going to underserved areas. But when you look at the demographics of the when you study it, you know, nurse practitioners go to the same places that doctors go to. They pretty much follow the same pattern. Now, they're not to say that there aren't some very, you know, um, there aren't some nurse practitioners that will go to underserved areas. But when you look at the overall predominance of the demographic of where people go, they still tend to go to those areas that have a more, um, a, a, a higher paying uh, constituency. Mm-hmm. I agree. This is my observation yeah. as well. Yeah. I don't, I don't think any of us really disagree with that. It, you know, it sounds good sometimes like, oh, we're expanding the scope so that we can serve um, uh, lower income communities and rural areas. And then to the point you're making that really doesn't manifest um, in that way. So we, rec- we recognize that. Excuse me, Madam um, President. Yes. Quick, quick clarifying question with regard to the request uh, rather the invitation to BRN to come to the next meeting, just to clarify, that would be for them to give us a presentation on how they intend to implement the bill. Um, is there any more detail about that that I could provide to them in terms of objectives for that presentation? Um, Dr. Krause, do you want to weigh in? That was your recommendation. What's, what is... Um... Well, what, what, what I would hope for them to be amenable to is to... Uh creating some kind of uh, continuing uh, communication or as suggested by uh, 
uh, other speakers a, a work group uh, of the two boards going forward. But basically, this really is the responsibility of the Board of Registered Nurses because it is nurses who have now um, a right to independent practice and an expanded scope of practice. So it would be appropriate to ask them to present to us in terms of their implementation of AB 890. But my real goal is to uh, use that meeting to further our collaboration on, on uh, the implementation. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Thanks. Um, let's take um, public comment because I believe there's going to be. Um, Ms. Public Ms. Pines, could I just make one other comment? And that, that is just to say, I apologize for interrupting you there. No, it's okay. Um, you know, this is not about trying to, to change the law. The law is the law. And it's been passed and it's in, it's certainly, that, that's not the intent. The intent is to, so that the, the law doesn't have unintended consequences that are adversely going to affect the public. And that's my concern is that we, that we create a, a, a collaborative relationship that is not going to be adversarial and and confrontational and difficult, but that is going to create a, a process that's going to allow, you know, the, the, the public to be served in a more effective way. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Agree. Okay, I'm now going to go to uh, Sean uh, for public comment on this um, AB 890 only. So, uh, first request we have, uh, the Q&A window is open if anyone would like to make a public comment on AB 190, or 890, I'm sorry, please go ahead and put your name in there. Uh, first up, we have Vaughn Chung from CMA here. Vaughn, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, to the board members for this robust discussion. This is um, what we believe um, will be necessary to ensure that this law is implemented appropriately. And we appreciate consideration of the request that was outlined by uh, Mr. Bone um, in the letter that was distributed to all of you. Um, I just, um, we appreciate the, um, the decision to uh, invite the BRN to present to the medical board. Um, ultimately, CMA believes that patient safety and consumer protection must be paramount priority in the implementation of AB 890. Um, guidance from the MBC informed by a policy and legal analysis of 890 on how the MBC views the role and responsibility of physicians under this framework will be necessary to better understand the physician's duty of care and potential liability risks created by AB 890. Uh, moreover, in light of the expanded functions that NPs can perform, the NBC has a responsibility to assess how the BRN's regulations will impact the practice of medicine and to be able to provide necessary information to its own licensees regarding appropriate supervision where required. Um, I think the goal here should be to safeguard the doctor-patient relationship, and we believe that's fundamental to ensuring that patient access to their physicians and physician autonomy regarding the structure of their medical practice when choosing which allied health professionals to employ uh, or retain in order to provide the highest level of care to their patients. And uh, we just wanted to um, highlight, although I believe the, the board's discussion reflects this, that full implementation of AB 890 um, could take several years. So it is important that the board remain fully engaged uh, throughout the implementation. There are multiple milestones that need to be achieved during its implementation. And we really want to make sure that um, Appropriate engagement is there to advance health equity policies and ensure that all patients have equitable access to the highest level of medical care from their treating physicians. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Katrina Reyes. Katrina, are you there? Okay. Try again. I think I heard you there at the end. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, good evening. Um, Board members, um, this is Katrina Reyes with the California Academy of Family Physicians. I'd like to just thank the board for taking up this issue um, this evening. And I would like to just echo um, the comments by Yvonne Chung, um, but we also 
we, we would support a collaboration with the BRN, um, the medical board collaborating with the BRN, because as um, you know, Dr. Thorpe had mentioned, it is a um, complex law um, with a lot of um, issues that needs to be addressed, such as the um, referrals and collaboration um, that NPs and physicians will need to have, um, and what is the liability associated with that. So those sorts of um, those are sorts of issues that the, both the BRN and the medical board will need to address. Um, so we certainly support um, collaboration on 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 pieces that would impact both physicians and NPs um, and clarifications that would be needed um, from the from this complex law. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At uh, this time, I don't see any additional requests for public comment. Okay, uh, Mr. Baum, please continue. Thank you, Madam President. Next is AB 1710, which allows authorized pharmacists to independently initiate and administer any FDA approved or authorized COVID-19 vaccine to persons aged three or older. The board adopted a support if amended position at the August meeting contingent upon the bill being amended to limit this authority only to COVID-19 vaccines. That amendment was taken, therefore the board moved to a support position. With regard to implementation, staff plan to include information about this bill in the newsletter. With that, I'll pause for any comments or questions about this bill. Members, any comments or questions? I think it's great. Okay, me too. <laughs> um, any, uh, uh, Sean, any comments from the public, please? I've opened up the Q and A window. If anyone would like to make a public comment, okay, I have a, a request here from Daniel Martinez. Daniel, let me open your line. Daniel, are you there? Yes, I'm. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Danny Martinez. I'm with the California Pharmacists Association. I just want to say thank you to the board uh, for taking a support position on this, and uh, we look forward to getting our pharmacists armed with the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I don't see any additional requests, so go ahead and shut it down. Okay, Mr. Bone, please continue. Thank you. Moving on to AB 2273. This is the bill that <clears throat> granted academic medical centers, as defined in the bill, access to the board's special permit programs. This bill was sponsored by Cedar sinai As noted in the analysis, the board adopted a support if amended position at its August meeting, as it was concerned that Cedar sinai would be the only qualifying academic, academic medical center under the bill. The board requested an amendment to remove a requirement that a facility have at least 750 beds. The author took this amendment, but also added new language to the bill requiring a facility to have a certain intern and resident to bed ratio and conduct annually research in an amount of at least $100 million. Staff expressed concern to the author and sponsor that this language might further constrain the number of facilities that would qualify under the bill. The author and sponsor agreed to remove this language, but was unable to do so before the legislature was required to approve the bill prior to August 31st. The author and sponsor agreed to address this in subsequent legislation next year. In addition, Senator Richard Pan requested certain amendments that were unable to be included, again, due to the same time constraints. The author and sponsor also agreed to make these changes next year, and those changes are noted in pages two and three of the analysis. I've already been in contact with uh, representatives from Cedars on this matter and look forward to working closely with them in the coming weeks on subsequent legislation that would address these issues I mentioned. Staff would welcome any comments or further direction that the board may have on this upcoming legislation. To implement AB 2273, in the meantime, staff will update the relevant licensing forms, procedures, and related content on our website. Further. A rulemaking will need to be conducted to update the board's regulations related to the various special permit programs currently available only to medical centers. With that I will pause and happy to take any questions or comments, Madam President. 
Uh, uh, Spine, uh, Dr. Gandhi. Yes, sir. I was puzzled when I saw that there is $100 million research thing, which wasn't there when we heard, when we asked for the amendment. I said, where did it come from? Uh, by the way, this, this for the rest of the members, I'm the chair of the Special Faculty Permit Committee. So we need to work on to really remove those uh, because a lot of people, when they looked at it, asked me, what's the definition of an academic medical center? My answer was there isn't any. There are multiple loose definitions, but by, uh, by this law, with the, hopefully with the amendments, this becomes a de facto definition of the academic medical center. And we want to make sure that decent training institutions who are involved uh, become academic med medical centers rather than the only ones who do bench research and get $100 million plus in, uh, in, uh, in grants, which is extremely difficult. That makes it also, other than the medical school hospitals, maybe only Cedars is eligible. So that's why I think it's extremely important for us to, uh, you, you mentioned already the author agreed and it's extremely important for us to work with him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from the members? Okay, Sean, let's go to comments from pu the public. Let's open up the Q&A window. If anyone would like to make a public comment, please indicate so. Give it a few more seconds here. Okay, this time I don't see any requests. Okay, uh, Mr. Bone, please continue. Uh, if I may first, Madam President, I do have a question. Aaron, you're on mute. Sorry. Thank you, Sean. Um, a quick clarifying question, if I may, to Dr. Ganadev. Um, sir, did you, you focused in on the removing the $100 million um, language. Do you, does your, uh, your passion for that also extend to that definition that includes the intern and resident to bed ratio requirements? Because that was a that's uh, uh, enc encapsulating kind of one aspect of the definition. So just to clarify, we'll, we'll be removing, we'll be working with them to remove both of those aspects. Is that correct, yeah. Doctor? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. I think that was also added on, which wasn't there when this bill board reviewed and uh, recommended, uh, recommended amendments. Thank you. That, yes, I agree. Thank you for that clarification. Um, thank uh, you. This is Lori. I had a question for Dr. Gananadev. If I may, uh, you know, I, I was looking at this and I saw that what was also included is the limit of five, five doctors with a, a, a special faculty permit within a year, I believe. And I was wondering, Dr. Dev, since you served on that committee for some time, if you see that as a limiting factor, because I, I mean, having sat on it with you for a short time, we have at least one or two a quarter. So five seems to be on the low end. What What are your thoughts there? Uh, Lori, I think it's a very good point. I think that it, that never even came up before. I'm glad you're pointing it out. Uh, uh, can you, uh, okay, did we ever talk to the author? Now I'm talking to a staff person on uh, the limiting of five, is it five per institution or five total for the entire state? Uh, stand by, I'm looking trying to find that language in the bill. I thought it was five for the entire state. That is for all the academic medical centers. Ms. Lubiano, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to find a section of the bill. I, I see it. It says uh, in the analysis, the bill does not allow the board to approve more than five applications for the SFP program submitted by AMC in okay. any calendar year. And this is Carrie. I think that was um, to make sure that there wasn't going to be. Uh, an overburden on uh, the board's process 
in implementing this. So, uh, uh, Lori, I saw five uh, total for the academic medical centers per year. That's what I'm understanding what you said. If, yes, that's if, what it reads. Yeah, in the document. If it is, I think initially will be okay, like Terry mentioned, but they can always be modification. We don't know how far this is going to go. So I think having some number initially is good uh, because remember that medical schools can still do that. And so there, there can be significant numbers. So five total from the academic medical center, I don't expect anything other than Cedar sinai to qualify at this time until it gets amended. Then see, I think then having some some limit, uh, I think it's, uh, it is okay. I have a question. Um, what do we think about the 100 research students and postdoctoral researchers annually in those institutions? Is that an average or that's also in very big institutions? Well, I I think so the research students, it doesn't say that they got to be bench researchers. If you have residents, they all will be doing some clinical research. And if you have students going through, they'll all be, so that wasn't, if it was defined that it was bench research, then it becomes worrisome, but otherwise it's okay. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like no no changes recommended at this time with regard to the volume of um, special faculty permits that can be granted today. At least. Okay. All right. Thank you for the discussion. Uh, next up is uh, Senate Bill twelve thirty seven. This is a bill that allows certified nurse midwives to attend to low risk pregnancies and provide prenatal, intrapartum, and postpartum care without the supervision of a physician. The board had a support position on this bill. Similar to AB 890, this bill pertains to licensees of the Board of Registered Nursing. Therefore, with regard to implementation, staff plan to inform our licensees of these changes to the scope of practice of certified nurse midwives through our board's newsletter. Okay, do we have any Comments from the members? Yeah, this, this, uh, I'm sorry, Dennis, this is there. So uh, sure. this bill had a lot of support uh, from, uh, the, from the, I think if I recall, even the OBGYN Association. So that's why I want to make sure that when we do the sunset with the license at point, we do model this bill so that we got something there for, for patient protection. That's how I'm saying. Dr. Hawkins, and now I imagine uh, rather states are going to be adequate disclosure, but I wonder how much confusion the public is going to have between uh, certified nurse midwives versus licensed midwives. So. Um, well, I think that's a good question because. To be honest with you, it's only been since I've been on the medical board that I understood the difference. <laughs> I agree. I second that. They're they sound alike. Aaron, it looked like you were about to say something, were you, Aaron? Uh no, I, I think Dr. Hawkins, you know, we could we could certainly, you know, look to what see what information we could put onto our website that that helps to clarify perhaps some of the differences between LMs and CNMs. Good idea. Okay, any other comments from the members? Okay, Sean, let's go to um, the public. Comments from the public. I'm going to open the Q&A box. If anyone would like to make a public comment, please indicate so. Uh, first up we have, Von Chang. Yvonne, are you there? I am, thank you. Um, Yvonne Chung, California Medical Association. Um, uh, unlike AB 890, we believe that SB 1237 more clearly defines the scope of practice for certified nurse midwives 
and the mechanisms for physician interaction in the absence of standardized protocols. Um, just um, to let this the board know, it's our understanding that the BRN will be conducting outreach to the medical board and the osteopathic medical board to solicit assistance with identifying physicians who can serve on the nurse midwifery advisory committee that's being established to advise on the oversight of CNMs by the BRN. Uh, we would encourage the MBC and the members of the board to be actively engaged in this process and to keep its licensees informed about how CNM practice moving forward will impact medical practice. And um, the board may wish to consider similar to um, what you are doing with AB 890 of asking the BRN to also provide some information about what their process, do a presentation for this board about what their process will be going forward. And again, I think coordination is important in terms of information that's going out to um, licensees of both boards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, next up, we have Liz Donnelly. Liz, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Donnelly, and I'm um, Health Policy Vice Chair for the California Nurse Midwife Association. Um, thank you to the board for your support of this bill. Um, and I just wanted to say that I agree with Yvonne that I think um, coordination with the BRN will be extremely useful um, and making sure that the information that's going out from the medical board uh, is in tandem and reflects the same information as that coming out from the BRN. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Brian Spencer. Brian, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you. Um, and actually, I, I do appreciate the comments that are made about the differences between the licensed midwives and the certified nurse midwives. And I do think there'll be some value with separating the two because there are very clear, distinct differences as I kind of alluded to in my previous comments on the sunset report. Uh, as part of 1237, which um, I would agree with Yvonne, um, we actually, we had a neutral, we being the American College of OBGYNs, District 9 ACOG, we uh, had a neutral position on the bill, but we will contend that it, it was a good bill in the end. Um, part of that bill created a new advisory committee uh, that was included two qualified physicians as members, as Yvonne from CMA mentioned. So we would agree as you get the word out about the bill, just want to encourage uh, the board to take a more active role in ensuring the slots of those two qualified members on the advisory committee are indeed filled. What we heard in our discussions with the nurse midwives was a concern that it's difficult sometimes to get members to sit on these advisory committee, uh, but we really appreciate some assistance in doing that. And I'll take it a step further. Um, we uh, ACOG would ask that those physicians, as in statute says, qualified physicians would, of course, be uh, obstetricians and gynecologists. So, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up, we have Eric Andrews. Eric, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, pull out your cell phones real quick and go to the medical board's Twitter page because you'll see Ron hit Lewis's alternate water bottle. Thanks. Thank you for your public comments. At this time, I didn't see any addition. Okay. Uh, Mr. Baum, please continue. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, finally, is Senate Bill 1474, which was an omnibus bill that included four items at the request of the board, which are detailed in the analysis. Uh, the bill um, also includes a section that prohibits anyone regulated by a licensing board from including within a contract for consumer services a provision that prevents the patient from filing a complaint or participating in an investigation of that licensing board. Board staff plan to include mention of these changes in the law through the newsletter, update related content on the website, and notify and train as necessary the board's licensing and enforcement staff, including HQIU and the Attorney General's office. Uh, Madam President, this concludes my remarks on this item. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, members, do you have any comments or questions? Okay, let's go to uh, Sean. Please open the line for public comments. Yes, I've opened the Q&A window. If anyone would like to make a public comment. Give it a few seconds here, just in case.
Okay, this time I'm not seeing any requests. Okay, uh, our next item is 11B, status of regulatory actions. Mr. Baum, please continue. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, we'd be happy to take any questions that the members may have upon the status of the pending regulations. Members? Okay. Um, any comments uh, uh, from the public? Sean, please go to the web line. Any comments on the regulation? A few more seconds here. I'm not seeing anything yet. Okay, at this time I'm not seeing any requests. Okay, um, so before we end today's meeting, I'd like to take about 30 seconds to recognize Mr. Hollingsworth um, and his champion, Marianne Hollingsworth. <clears throat> Thank you, I appreciate that. The board now will recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Bye-bye, so good evening. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.